Well, good afternoon and uh, welcome. It's uh, my pleasure to welcome you to the first uh, public meeting held by the advisory committee of uh, the NIH Director uh, Precision Medicine Initiative Working Group. Uh, this group was uh, assembled in March of this year as a uh, result of the President's launch of the Precision Medicine Initiative on January 20, uh, uh, 2015, and which charged in part with developing a plan for creating and managing a large U.S. research cohort with data and specimens of a hundred or uh, with one million or more uh, voluntary participants. Uh, the goal of this cohort is to help researchers understand the variables that contribute to health and disease and will ultimately translate uh, that knowledge into treatments that are tailored to individual subjects. So the preliminary efforts uh, to begin key discussions uh, about this cohort uh, design included an NIH workshop that was held in, on February 11th and 12th uh, here at NIH. Uh, this workshop uh, today and tomorrow is the first of five additional workshops uh, that will help inform uh, the ACD uh, Precision Medicine Working Group on how to best uh, design the cohort, which will uh, result in a report of the working group that will be delivered to uh, Someone the Someone has joined committee. the conference. Hello. Thank you. Uh, to the ACD in a public meeting in September. So additional meetings will be held, uh, and the next meeting following this one will be on May 28 and 29, uh, and we'll convene a public workshop at Vanderbilt uh, University in Nashville on the use of electronic health records uh, and uh, development of cohorts. On July 1st and 2nd, the working group will hold a workshop here again here at the NIH that focuses on cohort uh, participants uh, as well as community engagement and health disparities. Uh, finally, on July 27 and 28, the working group will hold another workshop in Santa Clara, California that explores uh, mobile health technologies and environmental measures. More information about these meetings uh, and the uh, advisory council uh, to the uh, NIH director, PMI Working Group, uh, can be found on the NIH Precision Medicine Initiative web, web pages. So in brief, uh, when we were thinking about uh, uh, the types of workshops that we wanted to have, we thought it was very important to have the first workshop think uh, as close to a, a an, a blue sky meeting thinking about what are the big opportunities that if uh, we collected the most creative minds around the country to think about what could be done with a cohort of a million individuals that was going to be followed longitudinally, what key questions could we ask that uh, would not just provide incremental changes to how we understand health and disease, but might really transform uh, this understanding. And so we have uh, assembled today, and I want to uh, uh, thank all of the participants. Uh, as everyone uh, who has participated in this process uh, knows, uh, this has really been done uh, at breakneck speed and uh, with very little uh, advance time. And uh, the staff at uh, NIH has done an extraordinary job uh, in, in getting things together, uh, helping on the fly and then getting all the invitations out and uh, thank uh, Francis Collins for uh, his efforts uh, to uh, uh, exhort uh, people to uh, be here. And uh, I think as you'll see over the next uh, uh, day and a half that uh, we've really got a, a, an extraordinary group of individuals together to uh, give us uh, their thoughts about what can be done across many different uh, uh, takes of the uh, bites out of the pie to uh, think about uh, in their disciplines what are the big questions that we might be able to solve now that we couldn't have imagined solving uh, a, a generation ago or even five years ago in uh, many cases. And I think uh, this will really be a, a fascinating uh, uh, session uh, today and tomorrow. So today we will have uh, three sessions. Uh, one of these will be on uh, uh, genomics and other new technologies that uh, will allow us to measure things in ways that we haven't uh, before, uh, environmental and behavioral factors that impact on health, uh, and uh, analysis of large data sets. And the speakers in uh, each of these sessions will be answering, you know, these key questions of what are the recent major advances in your field that were previously unthinkable 
and that could be deployed in the pr uh, proposed research cohort. Uh, what is on the horizon right now or coming very soon uh, that uh, uh, could potentially be made possible in the context of a large uh, national research cohort? Tomorrow we will have uh, additional presentations on use cases that uh, address the question, what are the near and uh, longer term use cases for large national uh, research cohort? Uh, the panelists will provide uh, their ideas uh, about uh, what their field can't accomplish now that it might be able to accomplish uh, 5, 10, or 20 years from now after standing up a cohort of the sort that we're discussing uh, and then going forward. Immediately following the workshop, uh, the ACD uh, Precision Medicine Initiative Working Group will convene in a closed session uh, to review and further deliberate uh, what's been learned over the last uh, two days. A few uh, housekeeping notes that I want to add. Uh, this workshop is available uh, via webcast, and you can also follow the workshop discussion uh, on Twitter using the hashtag, uh, hashtag uh, PMI Network. Uh, throughout uh, today and tomorrow, uh, We'll be pulling a few selected comments and questions from Twitter to incorporate into the open discussion after each uh, session. Uh, in addition, uh, NIH encourages those of you who are attending the meeting to participate in our Face of Precision Medicine initiative video collection uh, by sharing your thoughts and expertise on precision medicine or the research uh, cohort during a short on-camera interview. I'm sure you all will look forward to that. Uh, please uh, take a few moments today or tomorrow uh, uh, to visit the video booth. Uh, it's just across uh, the hall uh, in room uh, F1 and F2, uh, which is staffed by members of uh, the NIH communications uh, team. They'll need only about five minutes uh, of your time uh, to make a short video that could potentially be posted uh, on the NIH PMI uh, webpage. And now, without further ado, I'd like to get down to uh, the business of uh, our meeting. And uh, first, I, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, uh, my friend Sharon Terry, President and CEO of uh, Genetica Alliance, who will be discussing the most important uh, piece of uh, the cohort, the participant. Sharon, thanks very much. Thanks very much. It's a, a great honor to kick off this meeting, and I'm really looking forward to the work of, uh, of the next year and years, actually. And my topic is why PMI. The best time for PMI is 20 years ago. The second best time is now. When we ask why, I think we know there are millions of, an of answers to this question. One answer is my friend Mark Edelson, who died four days ago of lymphoma. We could have treated him better, we could have understood his cancer better, we could have understood his treatment better and the suffering he endured. And we could even capture that suffering so that we understand better for future individuals in a project in an initiative like this. A second reason are people like Robin Williams. If we could understand mental health and mental illness, understand the other things that individuals associate with these conditions, we could forego the kinds of suffering that he underwent as well. The third reason, and I clearly am not going to go through millions of these, is one that I invite you to paint yourself. You all have many, many p individuals in your lives that you wish could not suffer anymore, did not suffer when they did, and this space is for them. I'm here because my children were diagnosed in 1994 with a rare genetic disease. Today in 2015, they're happy and healthy, though they progress and continue to, to progress with this condition, pseudoxanthoma elasticum. The important thing here is that we begin today to resolve that we're going to make a difference. It's urgent, but we forget. It's really interesting to me how easy it is for us to forget. Even we advocates forget, and the advocacy organization or some thought becomes far more important than our original mission, the place where we started, the reason we're doing this, that we all know so well. All the things on this slide are the things that help us forget. We need money. We need more papers. We need strategies. We need experiments. Science is hard. Lots of meetings, lots of data, lots of noise. But this is not business as usual, this initiative. Now, 
If we want to, we can make a difference this time. There's only one time in the history of each planet when its inhabitants first wire up the innumerable parts to make one large machine, and you and I are alive at this moment. The time's right, and you've all seen this graphic because the human genome's been sequenced, we have improved technologies for biomedical analysis, we have new tools for data sets. Beyond that, we've always said, and you know, it's really tough, the people part of this. There are needles in a haystack, we can't find them, it's difficult. The haystack is made of needles. Every single one of us and every single person watching and every single person on this planet is part of who contributes and wants to contribute to this initiative. We have lots of ways to do that now. Frictionless data collection is easy. We keep seeing these technologies, wearable devices, ways to collect information, just pour out of technology, innovation, other uh, communities. This has to happen in the communities where we live, and it has to happen with participants as full partners. We've heard that from President Obama. We've heard it, heard it from Dr. Collins. We have heard that this is going to be a key piece of this initiative, which I believe will make the difference. So why? Is this really different? People have asked that question. There are definitely pessimists among, among us, glass half full. Is this really different? We're going to make a lot of plans. We're going to be quick and efficient and smart. We're going to have a strategy. But culture eats strategy for breakfast. <laughs> this is for all of us. Scientists, providers, advocates, teachers, plumbers, electricians, students, just plain people. We must risk as those who suffer risk every day. We must ask ourselves, how do we break down the boundaries, the silos? We must engage with each other as full partners, no one accepted. We must enter into this effort with our full minds and our hearts. We must always ask, what really matters when we're in the next negotiation, when we're working on getting something we want on the table? What really matters? We must be fearlessly present to one another and to the work we must love. So why? Because this is the moment. Because we have everything to lose. Because we are depending on us. Let's do it now. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sharon, for those really uh, moving and powerful words. It's my pleasure now to uh, introduce the moderator of our first session, uh, Jay Shenduri from uh, University of Washington, and he will introduce uh, the panel. Thanks. Hi, hi everyone. So uh, our first, uh, the topic of this first session is uh, genomics and other omic technologies. I think. Uh, this, this audience, I'm sure, appreciates genomics has had a tremendous impact um, in the just over a decade since the Human Genome Project. And uh, genetics, genomics, and omic technologies will, uh, of course, be a key part of, of this initiative. But I think specifically what this session will, will hopefully be about is trying to think uh, more specifically about what the, as Rick said earlier, what are the compelling scientific questions that are possible, will be made possible by an initiative like this. And, and uh, also kind of what specifically, how do we go about doing this, um, including when uh, and, and, uh, what, and what specifically in terms of technologies. So we have three terrific speakers. Uh, we have 10 minutes allocated to each, uh, and then uh, about 45 minutes for discussion after that. So uh, I think maybe hold your questions to the end. We'll get through the three talks, and then we'll, we'll go on to have hopefully a, a vigorous discussion. Uh, so our first speaker is uh, Ewan Ashley, who is a cardiovascular uh, practicing cardi cardiologist and, and cardiovascular geneticist at, at Stanford University, and his talk is uh, The Genome and Beyond. All right. Well, um, thanks, uh, Jay. Thanks to uh, Rick for the invitation and to Francis Collins and for everyone. It's really an honor and privilege to be here. Um, I've, over the course of the next 10 minutes, I hope to balance this idea of a little bit of brass tacks about the practicalities of what we might do in this space but also a little bit of blue sky thinking about how, how we might go forward. So uh, the genome and beyond, here are some of my disclosures, first of all. So I thought, especially since I was first up, that I'd give an opportunity to remind you what a million people is. 
Uh, in ter terms of disease, a million people is 50,000 cancer patients, 68,000 diabetics, almost 200,000 hypertensives, 65,000 heart disease patients. This is unselected across, across the population. 16,000 Alzheimer's disease patients. If we think of rare disease, we actually collect a fair number of rare disease patients too. Cystic fibrosis, would, there would be 400. Disease I spend a lot of time seeing patients for, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, 2,000. But we must also remember the diversity of the population and uh, 20,000 of our nation believe they've had an encounter with an <laughs> extraterrestrial life form. Um, <laughs> but there are some things we can probably get on everybody. So uh, if, if it's a million people, we can get a million heights probably, a million weights, a million girths, a million answers to any question, survey question that you can think of if we can deliver it and, and bring it back. Uh, we have phones in our pockets, most of us. They have cameras on them. We could take a photo of a million people and upload it to a, a site and we can analyze the facial features shown here for genetic disease. Perhaps those signals are also present in the population. If we can connect to electronic medical records, there might be a million blood sugars or serum sodiums. Essentially, this is an enormous opportunity for us uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm really happy uh, to be here to talk about it. Well, there's a transformative nature of putting a large data set just of genetic data together to begin with. Before we even begin to discover anything or develop anything on it, there's a transformative nature of this. And we've seen this with the exome sequencing project. I have to tell you that the day that was released uh, from 2,500 exomes were uh, released, I, I had to tear my genetic counselor away from her computer because she spent hours just looking up variants of, of patients that she knew in order to see if they were in this general population. We used to have control populations up to that point of 100 people and suddenly there were 2,500 with the exome aggregation consortium. We now have 65,000 at, uh, at a browser window. Uh, and I can tell you of a patient of mine, a 17-year-old kid, um, who had borderline changes on his ECG and his echocardiogram for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. He was an aspiring athlete who wanted to go have a scholarship for, uh, for athletics for college. He had a genetic test. There was a, a variant found in mice and heavy chain that was called by the lab pathogenic. And so on that basis of that evidence, he was suggested that he not pursue this, the, this uh, performance, uh, uh, this approach to, to athletics, and he wouldn't be eligible for the scholarship. Later, at the time the exome aggregation consortium just in the last six months came out, we realized that that variant is far too common in the population to be the cause of Mendelian disease in him, and so changed the interpretation of his findings in order to let him back uh, to athletics. So just having this data can be transformative before we do anything at all with it in terms of rediscovery. In fact, when we look at reclassification of variants, we looked at 1,000 variants recently and 10 individuals looked at their whole genomes. We found two-thirds of the variants were reclassified with new information that just simply came from having population-level genetic data available to us. Of course, it emphasizes the importance of diversity of the cohort because we discover by looking in diverse cohorts variants that were previously not seen in individual uh, populations but that cannot be the cause of Mendelian disease because they're relevant and, and common in other populations. So if you have a million people and six billion base pairs, that's six quadrillion base pairs. I'm sure you've all added that up uh, to this point. What can you do with that? You, you can do a lot. Um, at the moment, most of our platforms are uh, based around chips, and the chips are improving and moving forward. As the populations get larger, uh, we discover more. And those in the room and, and many others around the country have shown the proof of the pudding here in this graph from Peter Vischer. As the discovery sample size goes higher, the GWAS hits get greater, the amount of heritability uh, explained gets greater. And in the latest giant consortium uh, study, uh, you might recall a quarter of a million people led to 700 replicated uh, GWAS hits at a genome scale. So simply getting bigger uh, will give us more in common variation for complex traits. It also gives us more people who have rare or very rare variation, either to modify rare disease or contribute to those uh, complex traits. But even for diseases that, are, that have close to private variation, like Mendelian diseases, like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, there would be 2,000 individuals in a million-person cohort. The largest study to date of well phenotype patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy was 1,000 people. So we can double that size for this rare disease with this cohort. So the, the, uh, the, the potential here is enormous, not just for, for common disease and complex traits, but for rare disease. We may want, uh, this is all based on unselected phenotypes, of course, we may want to think about enriching for certain ones. But large cohort also allows us to do reverse genetics, uh, although the, the direction I'm always unclear whether this is forward or reverse, but you could start with the phenotype search, which would, sorry, you could end with the phenotype search and start with the genome analysis. The Regeneron and Geisinger uh, collaboration have talked about, about doing this. And there's this idea of genetic heroes, people who uh, are, are resilient despite the fact that they have what we would expect to be pathogenic variants, seem to be doing well and studying them uh, as the sage, sage and Mount Sinai folks have done. He's a great example of Eero Mantaranta, you might have heard him, of him who had uh, 
was in fact banned for blood doping. Uh, but it turned out he had a familial syndrome. He won five gold medals, uh, but was then banned for blood doping. Uh, it turned out he had a familial syndrome uh, with a truncated erythropoietin receptor that was actually the cause of his uh, super ability uh, in, in athletics. And so we can find people like this as well if we look uh, carefully. I would make a vote for the strength of family analysis. Here's an example from our uh, genome sequencing uh, group at Stanford, the Clinical Genome Project. Um, if you look uh, at either a singleton to look for the cause of a disease in a family quartet, you would see you can narrow that list to 450 genes or 40, 1,400 variants. If you have the power of having the trio or the quad, it's a very much significantly reduced list that you would have to go through to try and find the answer of the order of 10 genes and only about 20 variants. If it takes an hour to really look through one single variant, uh, then the power of family analysis, I think, here is clear, and I would have a significant vote for some family stratification within the cohort. So the big question then is how much of what should we, should we buy? And this is a very practical slide. Uh, there are new chips available. The UK Biobank, of course, is uh, halfway through their uh, genotyping of uh, 500,000 individuals in the UK Biobank. There are new arrays like this one that Carlos Bismonti's lab has developed, uh, along with Illumina, that is particularly focused on multi-ethnic uh, uh, genome-wide hits. And is the imputation uh, criteria uh, for the rarer variants is significantly improved. Uh, compared to earlier generations. So our chips continue to move on and are very cost effective. Low coverage sequencing, of course, has been shown to be very effective for discovery by the Thousand Genomes Project. But if we're really talking precision medicine, we're really talking about making calls for individual people, then we're looking at higher coverage sequencing, clinical grade calling. And I think we just want to be a little word of wariness around standard off-the-shelf exome approaches. This is the KCNH2 gene, and from the XX server, this is the coverage of the different exons in this gene that causes long QT2 syndromes. This is an important gene. And you think that the exon that's shown there towards the end that has very poor coverage might not be important. But if you look in ClinVar, there are 19 pathogenic or likely pathogenic variants in that exon. So uh, a number of us have been focused on this improving coverage. Of course, whole genome sequencing gets you there a little better, but really individual groups now around the country, including uh, a company that Russ Altman and I have, have been involved with, have been focused on trying to fill in these holes. So if we're thinking about clinical grade call calling uh, of, in the, of the, and here shown the most important 56 genes from the ACMG, um, if this was Sanger sequencing, that this, and on the x-axis of these graphs at the bottom is the number of base pairs not called at a given quality. If this was Sanger sequencing, there'd be a line straight down at zero, because we don't call a base pair in Sanger sequencing unless we are confident. Um, but in the next generation data, and in particularly whole genome sequencing, for these 56 genes, you can see often the curve moves quite far to the right, and there are thousands of base pairs not called in those genes. So I think a, a word of warning that if we are really interested in returning results to patients and we're interested in precision medicine, we have to think about clinical grade calling from our sequencing. At the moment, I think the balance of data for dollar is probably this filled kind of exome sequencing plus a low coverage whole genome. But that's something clearly we can talk about in the discussions. There are new platforms heading our way. Uh, Complete Genomics will probably reappear this year. Uh, there are long read technologies that are gathering momentum. Uh, the, these are the that you see on, on the screen. You would hope that the 56 genes shown again here would mostly be in regions that NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, had declared high confidence. Uh, but in reality, for these 56 genes, you can see high confidence would be up at the top of the screen at level one. There are many dots below that. So there are many parts of many of those important genes, and those are, the, we think, some of the most important ones, that are not in high confidence regions. And I think long read sequencing will help us with that. This is more in the range of on the horizon for what we could do with this cohort. This is a, a graph from Evan Eichler's paper from the Hydatidiform Mole uh, in Nature of, of this year, showing the extent to which we discover large structural variations with long read technologies. And I think that this is something that is in the future, not in, in the immediate future, but something that we would think of in the lifetime of this cohort. So as a postscript, just to my uh, 10 minutes, I wanted to, to, to make one non-genomics point, uh, uh, for the, uh, I kind of vote for the neglected dimension, which is time. Because I think the genome is the, just the very start. It's really how our genome predisposes us to things that we interact with over time that really defines who we are uh, and what we do. Uh, and time series is something that we ignore mostly because just because we don't, we can't deal with the data, we, it takes too long uh, to, to measure people every day. But we're not the same person in the morning as we are in the afternoon. And some of us aren't the same after a cup of coffee. Uh, and so uh, if we're measuring people at one moment in time, uh, I think that we're limited. Uh, and uh, so I think that there are signals also within the rhythms of our life. Heart rate variability is a signal that's very accessible now. How do we do that? We can do that with these kinds of devices. And, We've had fun based in Stanford as we are uh, in Silicon Valley, get, being close to many of the companies developing these sorts of devices. We get to wear four watches at a time now. Uh, if, you walk, if you walk around Silicon Valley, you'll notice uh, some of us 
Um, also, we had the privilege of working with Apple over the last year, uh, and thanks to Sharon for showing our app on her slide up there. Uh, we launched this app just two weeks ago. I just wanted to show you the, the very first public data uh, from it just very quickly in this last minute. One of the key things about the app was we managed to persuade the, the lawyers to allow us to do consent entirely on the phone. And so the in, entire amount of the consent form that is then filed with the IRB at Stanford is carried out on the phone with each page giving you a small amount of data and the opportunity to learn more about each of these issues. And so this was, a, a, I think, maybe our greatest achievement. And here's some of the earliest data. This is simply a sanity check. This is the physical activity from the motion sensor and the phone of 18,000 people. I should mention that in the first two weeks after launching the study, 30,000 people consented. And so that was a study that didn't exist a month ago. And we're now holding a, a baby that is a clinical study with 30,000 people in it. But the physical activity is good. This is out of the day along the bottom. So people get up during the day and move around. There's a little peak at lunchtime, a little peak at 5 PM when people exercise. You can also ask questions like this. How happy do you feel on a scale of 0 to 10 and map it to, uh, to the country? You can see that California, Texas, Florida looking fairly happy there, the, the parts of the country where they had 100 inches of snow. Um, <laughs> over winter, not looking quite so happy. I was interested in North and South Dakota, you see there a little bit. Uh, <laughs> and so I looked this up because not being from North or South Dakota, I didn't understand why that might be the case. But it turns out that this article a month ago suggested that North Dakota had all the oil and that they were much happier there because they had all the oil. I'm not sure if that's a one-to-one -one correlation. All right, so just my final thoughts. Um, I think clearly for a cohort like this, we would have to make a just-in-time decision for the genomic approach. It's moving so fast, we're all used to the graphs showing just how fast genomic technology moves. I think we can think about incremental approaches where we gather some data, but later we can add more genomic data as it goes forward. We'll hear, I think, about other omics approaches just coming up. I think some a really important thing that this group could do, I think the PMI is large enough to have a convening influence internationally. If, if the technology sector can get together and come up with USB-C, which is the newest one, or any of the other standards internationally, I think we can do that for medicine and bring together the large groups to really de uh, decide how to do that. I think flexible models of consent with open consent as an option is something that we should consider. I think connecting the cohort live through mobile health devices is something that is, is just going to be a no-brainer as we move forward, uh, both for engagement and uh, data collection. And finally, of course, this is all about medicine at the end of the day, understanding disease better and more precisely uh, target the therapy at it. So thank you very much for the invitation. I look forward to the discussion. Thanks, Yuan, for the terrific talk. So our next speaker is uh, Vamsi Mutha, uh, who is a physician and uh, 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 human geneticist at Harvard Medical School, widely known for his work on mitochondria and uh, metabolic diseases. So uh, Vamsi. So I'd like to thank uh, Rick and uh, Francis for the invitation to come and uh, participate in this brainstorming session. Uh, and I'm going to uh, 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 just begin by just 
uh, commenting that I think the challenge that lies ahead is a huge one. Um, you know, I think the fundamental goal of, 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 of genomic medicine, of precision medicine, is to try to establish some sort of a mapping between the genome and clinical phenotype. And, you know, at a very fundamental level, the reason this is so difficult is because the genome is, um, you know, uh, uh, very finite. I mean, on this planet, we only have about 14 billion chromosomes. As large a number as that is, it's a finite number. Clinical phenotypes, on the other hand, not only are they not finite, but they're infinite, and infinite comes in two flavors, countable infinite and uncountable infinite. And so the clinical phenotype comes from the latter category. So trying to map a finite number of items to an uncountable number of infinite uh, things is a really, really tough challenge. And uh, uh, even understanding the genome alone is tough. We're, we're just now beginning to understand, you know, a small fraction of all of the protein encoding genes, but on top of that, we have non-coding RNAs, we have regulatory elements, and then we have 99 percent of rest of the genome. And so we have a huge challenge ahead of us, and I think what's really exciting about the Precision Medicine Initiative is that there's an opportunity to simultaneously advance fundamental basic science while also advancing real clinical medicine. And so somehow or another, we need to get across from here to here. Um, and I've hopefully just persuaded you that doing a direct leap is going to be very difficult. And my fundamental thesis is that something called the metabolome is probably going to be one of the most valuable pieces of data that we can collect in the Precision Medicine Initiative. Uh, this is something that's going to allow us to link the genome to the metabolome. Uh, to, this is a high-dimensional data set. I'm going to describe it in just a second. It's a high-dimensional data set that because of 50 years of biochemistry, we actually have an initial understanding of what that map looks like. And so uh, 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 with uh, uh, measurements of the metabolome, we'll be able to start making connections between the genome and the metabolome. And of course, in clinical medicine, we, rut we routinely make measurements of subsets of what's called the metabolome. And so we can begin to uh, identify biochemicals that are related to the clinical phenotype. Uh, one of the other really nice things about the metabolome is that it also incorporates the environment. And we all know that the genome and the environment and time all end up influencing the clinical phenotype. And so the, the metabolome is something that nicely integrates uh, uh, what we've inherited with what we're exposed to. Okay, so what exactly is this metabolome? Okay, so um, I need to begin by just defining for everyone what metabolites are. These should be relatively familiar to all of you. Metabolites are small molecule chemicals either produced endogenously or derived exogenously. And so um, for, for, for hundreds of years, um, physicians have been using um, uh, metabolites to help to diagnose and manage disease. And so urine wheels, for example, have been used for hundreds of years, uh, whereby physicians would actually look at the color of urine, look at the would actually smell the urine, even sometimes even taste the urine in order to be able to diagnose what a patient might be suffering from. In all of those instances, what these clinicians are doing, they are assaying metabolites uh, 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 using different means. Uh, imagine practicing medicine without the benefit of a Chem 7. This is something that we're all very familiar with. Uh, and there's different types of technologies for measuring seven metabolites, a single metabolite, even a metabolite that you get on a Friday night. Um, and larger panels have been uh, 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 profiled uh, routinely throughout all of the 50 states in the United States. This is what we call newborn screening. Um, almost every single state in the United States screens about 30 to, 30 to 50 different metabolites, uh, and in many instances, the outcomes from these studies uh, guide uh, 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 clinical medicines. So uh, these uh, uh, have had life-saving uh, uh, impact. And so we're all pretty accustomed to metabolites, but what's changed over the last decade? You know, each of these interrogates anywhere between 1 and 50 metabolites, but what's really exciting is that uh, new technologies are here um, that now allow us to profile uh, not 1, not 50, but literally thousands of metabolites in a single snapshot. And so this is what's referred to as uh, the metabolome uh, uh, and new technologies that are based on mass spectrometry, based on nuclear magnetic resonance, allow us to measure from a blood sample, from a urine sample, literally thousands of different chemicals in a single experiment. And so this is a canonical experiment. You collect a biofluid, uh, you separate it, and then make measurements uh, using 
analytical chemistry modalities, uh, and then use uh, quite a bit of data analysis to then try to understand what those individual components are. Uh, this technolo these technologies are still in their relative infancy compared to something like genome sequencing, but they're now advanced enough so that we should be taking them for a ride in the Precision Medicine Initiative. So um, what are the potential benefits of incorporating large-scale metabolic profiling into uh, the PMI? So I'll argue that, first of all, uh, this provides one of the best ways of phenotyping patients. Uh, uh, it provides an extremely high-dimensional readout uh, of an individual at a given time, and this is valuable even independent of the genetics. So anybody that is opposing the, 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 the PMI because it's too genetics-focused, this uh, uh, is a nice rebuttal. This type of data set is useful even independent of the genetics. Uh, from a disease biology standpoint, what's really important is that the metabolomics will actually allow us to understand how a genetic variant actually causes uh, pathology. And then from a clinical utility perspective, metabolomics holds a promise to reveal valuable new biomarkers that can be useful for predicting disease, um, for identifying PD biomarkers, uh, and in some instances will also motivate new uh, nutritional interventions for actually curing disease. Uh, and then I think what's really exciting is if this is actually implemented on scale, uh, metabolomics in the PMI holds a potential to allow us to redraw those, those metabolic wall charts that we're all familiar with that are grossly incomplete at present. Uh, most of the wall charts that we see in our high school biochemistry textbooks, one-third to two-thirds of those pathways and metabolites are actually from plants. They're not even from humans. And so there's an opportunity here to basically reconstruct all of human metabolism. Um, and so there's a lot of challenges. Um, unlike the genome, the metabolome is highly dynamic. It's going to be different uh, in a fasting versus fed state. Uh, there's not going to be a single biofluid that's going to provide all of the information. Uh, we don't even know all of the metabolites at present, and even if we did know what all of the metabolites are, there's not a single modality that will allow us to profile all of them uh, in a single uh, shot. Um, and there's some technical challenges also, the way that you uh, purify the sample, uh, the way that you uh, store it, all of these can influence uh, our results. <clears throat> so uh, despite these challenges, uh, metabolomics is showing some uh, tremendous early promise. I'd like to take you through three short vignettes that will illustrate just how powerful the technology can be. And the first uh, uh, vignette comes from, um, began with sequencing. So uh, Ken Kinsler's group, uh, Bert Vogelstein's group, and Victor Velkulescu's groups collaborated uh, back in 2008 and 2009 to identify mutations in isocitrate dehydrogenase uh, that underlie uh, glioblastoma. And these are recurrent heterozygous mutations that are very common in uh, glioblastomas. And so these are the normal functions of uh, the isocitrate dehydrogenases. Now, uh, the biopharmaceutical company Agios was interested in understanding how mutations in this particular enzyme lead to disease. So what they did is they performed a metabolomics experiment. They expressed in a cell line either the wild type allele or the mutant allele, and they just did global profiling using these new technologies. And when they did that, most metabolites line up along the diagonal. But there were three metabolites that were much higher when you express the mutant allele as opposed to the wild type allele. And all three of those dots correspond to a metabolite that most people have never heard of. It's called 2-hydroxyglutarate. Okay. And so what's happening is when these enzymes are mutated, instead of conducting this chemical reaction, they conduct a, diff a different chemical reaction, and they produce a metabolite called 2-hydroxyglutarate. Um, and since uh, the, the Johns Hopkins initial report of these mutations, uh, these mutations have now been shown to be uh, occurring in a variety of other cancers. Uh, this metabolite, uh, 2-HG, can be picked up uh, in uh, the tumor samples, and you can also pick it up in the blood as well. And so this company at this point has developed uh, inhibitors to uh, these mutant enzymes. Uh, in their dose-finding exercises, they actually utilize uh, uh, 2-HG to guide uh, uh, dosing. Uh, and it's actually a marker that they can actually use uh, during uh, 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 the use of the drug as well. So it serves as a PD biomarker, and in principle, it can also serve as a marker of uh, 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 disease uh, remission as well. 
So the second vignette I'd like to share with you um, comes from the Framingham Heart Study. This is a study that was conducted by uh, Rob Gersten and Eugene, uh, uh, Eugene Rhee uh, and Tommy Wang in collaboration with the Framingham Heart Study. Uh, and I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna go into the details of the Framingham Heart Study except to say that what's really cool is uh, in one of the uh, arms of uh, one of the cohorts within Framing, Framingham, uh, uh, they had collected plasma samples quite some time ago from all of the participants. Now, as it turns out, over about a 12-year period, about 200 of these individuals would end up developing diabetes. So what these researchers did was they identified another 200 individuals that were age, gender, BMI matched at that initial time that did not develop diabetes. And then they performed metabolic profiling on those 200 that later developed diabetes versus those 200 that were matched that didn't develop diabetes. And what they found were five metabolites, which 12 years earlier, if those are high, that's highly predictive of future diabetes. So this is an excellent example of if you have sort of a prospective cohort in which you've collected samples, then you can see what happens to them in the future. You can actually figure out which metabolites at that time were predictive of future disease. They were able to replicate this in a second cohort, and I think this really speaks to the power of uh, metabolomics for predicting future disease. Just one more vignette. And this is related to what are called QTLs. It's a quantitative trait loci. Um, and this is uh, a slide that's courtesy of Karsten Schur, who's at Cornell. Um, and what he did in a study back in 2008 was basically genotyped uh, uh, a large number of individuals, also did some focused metabolic profiling using earlier generation technologies at that time. And what he found was that genetic variation in certain enzymes are predictive of variation in circulating metabolites. And then when he asked what the relationship is between those metabolites and those genes, in some cases, variation in a particular enzyme actually led to variation in metabolites that are actually either substrates or reactants. And so the reason this is so cool is if you know absolutely nothing about what this particular enzyme does, this is actually a procedure. It's a systematic, unbiased procedure that allows you to potentially de-orphan the activity of an enzyme or de-orphan the activity of a metabolite. On top of that, many enzymes that are really well studied, like lactate dehydrogenase, actually have more than one activity. They can often have secondary reactions as well. In the same way that a polymerase is imperfect, enzymes can also be imperfect and also catalyze secondary reactions. This type of approach allows you to identify promiscuous reactions as well. So this is what's called MQTL analysis. It requires that you simultaneously genotype and metabotype your cohort. And over the last couple of years, uh, we've seen larger and larger uh, MQTL studies in humans. Um, and so the latest study uh, 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 that was published in Nature Genetics, it was a collaboration between academia and industry uh, in, 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 in Europe, uh, and involved a few US investigators as well, actually revealed about 150 of these MQTLs. And so this was achieved by studying about 7,800 patients and profiling a bit over 500 metabolites. And so uh, what you can see is that uh, the more patients that we involve and the more metabolites that we profile, there's actually prospects for saturating the entire genome and the metabolome. And I'm super excited about the prospects of using this type of a data set to basically reconstruct all of human metabolism. And from that last study, here's a snapshot of about 100 genes and the metabolites that they control. And I'll just focus on one, on one of these MQTLs. This is an enzyme of unknown function called LACT-B. Uh, Eric Schatt, when he was at Rosetta, had identified this in one of his uh, genetics of gene expression studies as being potentially important for obesity. Uh, and they showed using transgenic technologies that if you manipulate this, it actually influences obesity and diabetes. This particular study now provides insight into the metabolic activity of the enzyme, uh, and that could actually be useful for setting up chemical screens, and it also provides opportunities for PD markers as well as uh, sort of a, a circulating readout of the activity of that enzyme. So, so hopefully those three vignettes illustrate the potential utility of having met metabolomics within the Precision Medicine Initiative. I'm just gonna close with this one final slide. Uh, as, uh, you as you design your cohort, I think it's 
really important to be thinking about uh, having a component that's certainly uh, prospective uh, to the extent possible. If you, if you could include families and twins, that actually allows you to uh, distinguish between uh, heritable and non-heritable uh, uh, contributions to the, metabol to the metabolome. I think it'd be really cool if there's a component that includes a birth cohort. Uh, I think in the USA, one huge advantage that we have uh, are a large number of uh, immigrants uh, and individuals with diverse ethnic and racial backgrounds. Uh, in each of these um, uh, metabolomes, one could imagine that in the same way you could have rare variants that are rare genetic variants that are specific to one racial or ethnic group. It could be possible that there are uh, metabolic pathways uh, that are similarly uh, 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 specific to individual groups. Uh, and one plug I'd like to make is uh, if, if, if it's possible to include a large number of patients with inborn errors of metabolism, I think this would be amazing because to some extent these patients uh, uh, can serve as almost eigenvectors, if you will, for being able to interpret the metabolomes from everyone else. Uh, they can really teach us uh, 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 the grammar of, of, of the metabolome. Uh, and then uh, I think we can go a really far away just with a simple fasting plasma sample as well as with uh, a first void uh, morning urine sample. Uh, and if Guthrie cards are available, they've been used for you know, about three decades or so uh, for targeted uh, uh, newborn screening. I anticipate that similar uh, uh, sample processing combined with new metabolomic technologies uh, would allow us to actually profile the entire metabolome uh, or a large fraction of it using even got three car technologies. Uh, and I think eventually w we want to get to uh, a million metabolomes, but of course uh, uh, we don't live in a world of infinite resources, and so what's going to be important is to determine whether, you know, to apply sort of uh, uh, a generic, uh, cheaper, uh, uh, more practical metabolic profiling strategy to all samples initially. Uh, versus perhaps going really deep on a prioritized uh, set of samples. But uh, this is uh, the kinetics, and I think eventually we want to get to uh, a million metabolomes. Uh, so with that, um, I will stop, and looking forward to the uh, brainstorming session. Great, thank you. Uh, our The third and last speaker of the session is uh, Vikram Bajaj, who is the... Uh, lead scientist at Google X uh, Life Sciences and is going to tell us about uh, Google's baseline study. So, thank you, Jay. Um, it's a real honor to be here, and I uh, want to thank Francis and his team uh, for the invitation. Uh, so as Jay mentioned, I'm going to talk about our own small little personalized medicine study, which is a program that we have launched with our academic collaborators at Duke and Stanford Universities. Uh, and it's called the baseline study. It is in its earliest stages. It's in a, a, a pilot stage. And so uh, to the extent that we were asked to respond to questions that are more in the blue sky territory, we won't be able to do that. I'll uh, respond by uh, raising additional questions. And I just hope to tell you a little bit about how we view this kind of precision medicine study as maybe unusual actors in this space, some of the problems that we're facing, and some of the solutions that we've postulated, if that's OK. Um, so first of all, it won't surprise you that we are approaching this from the point of view of data scientists and physical scientists um, a as a problem of developing more and better information about human health and disease. And of course, this is not a new idea. Here's a, an illustrative and old example, perhaps the first example where big data was used uh, to understand a clinical problem. And it's an example of the uh, famous epidemiologist John Snow and his understanding of the Broad Street cholera outbreak in 1854, in which by simply plotting data about cholera incidences on a map of London, he was able to localize it to a square around a pump, uh, the Broad Street pump. And by removing the handle of the pump, a prospective clinical experiment based on these data, he was able to cure the outbreak. And this is very interesting. It, it, it illustrates a problem with these studies. He removed the handle, and that's good enough for the clinical case. But this is at a time when the prevailing theory of pathophysiology of disease was miasma, foul airs, that kind of thing. And the lack of connection to laboratory methods is something that um, has uh, troubled us. And it's something that a precision me medicine initiative uh, should seek to strive so that we not only answer clinical questions, 
but we enable scientific investigations in the laboratories that would get to fundamental disease mechanisms. Uh, here's uh, another example that motivates us. There are many non-invasive tools that can be used to detect disease sooner and in the right populations more specifically. Here I've just shown a series of tools developed uh, over uh, the generations of increasing specificity and increasing information content in terms of what they show of disease. Starting on the left, this is the first time that we were able to peer into the human body without cutting it open. In the middle is a PET CT image showing metastatic cancer, and on the right is a diffusion tensor image which shows patterns of connectivity in the human brain. Uh, but the question is, these are so expensive, they're imprecise, they're applied infrequently. How can we develop technologies that non-invasively monitor disease, but more frequently, more continuously? And interestingly, this is also a story about consent. Uh, you see this uh, image on the left. Uh, look at the shadow, that's a shadow of a ring. And you see that Mr. Rontgen, he didn't trust his own contraption enough to use it on himself. Uh, so this is an image of his wife's hand, Mrs. Rontgen, uh, and that has hopefully changed too. Um, occasionally, uh, we have to remove things from the body to take more information, a biopsy or a tissue sample or a blood sample. And this is also something that uh, has motivated uh, everything that we're discussing here. Uh, cancer in oncology is a unique case because you can remove an element of the disease and subject it to laboratory analysis. So this was first perfected there. Uh, and here you can see as early as 1933, there's actually information before this, uh, morphological images of stained breast cancer sections. This is an H&E stain clearly showing the cancer. And this is a precise, personalized measurement of the cancer. But look what happened in 1953, 20 years uh, later, there's not much development. It is uh, still an H&E stain showing uh, a tumor. 1983, same thing. Later on in 1999, now the pictures are in color and you have also, admittedly, some basic immunohistochemistry which can tell you about molecular biology. But look what happened in 2012, and, and this is uh, really instructive for everything that we are talking about. Here you have, for the first time through the TCGA project, a molecular description of cancer one which combines multiple kinds of measurements, genetic measurements, expression measurements, other kinds of measurements with unique pathway-based analyses. And it is very important that we begin to regard personalized precision medicine uh, really as a redefinition of disease from one in which we define disease in terms of places of origin or symptoms with which the patient presents to the doctor to one in which we adopt an ontology in terms of molecular observables that will vary from person to person more predictably and which will be apparent earlier. Now the key question that we have to solve is how can you do something like this uh, in uh, diseases for which there's no excisional sample possible, no biopsy possible. Take an autoimmune disease, for example. And we think, as we'll describe, that metabolomics and other kinds of multidimensional measurements uh, are the answer. Um, so let's continue in uh, describing our thinking about this. Of course, all of uh, precision medicine, including the cohorts that we are going to discuss this afternoon, are longitudinal studies. And there are some very storied longitudinal studies, notably the Framingham Heart Study, which has already been discussed. We've learned so much from these. Uh, including the benefits of exercise, the negative effects of smoking, um, uh, the role of elevated HDL in cardiovascular pathologies. But the problem is they take a long time uh, to develop uh, results. And uh, the profiling is usually very um, uh, low dimensionality. Uh, and so that's something that we have uh, sought to improve. Uh, another issue of these studies is uh, their retention and patient engagement. And, and th this is very depressing in, in clinical trials. You know, only three to 5% of adult oncology patients are in trials uh, in spite of the uh, benefits uh, of being in trials. That's not the case in pediatric oncology. And so one of the issues that we are seeking to solve as we contemplate these large studies, and it's relevant for the precision medicine study as well, is how to put patients at the center, patients and their advocates, in the process of uh, recruiting cohorts 
and in the process of engaging with them over time, including through the use of new tools. Here are some examples of web portals that work quite well to engage with patients, but tools beyond that. So that's a concern that motivated our steady design. And in fact, uh, I would even call it one of the endpoints uh, of our pilot. Uh, another issue that we have already heard about is uh, that most of these longitudinal studies, they do not have very specific hypothesis-free profiling of patients. And really, germline genomic data alone obviously do not fully characterize the biology in a hypothesis-free way. Um, there are also very few normal controls in those experiments. And we think of it a little bit as illustrated here, uh, of producing a map, if you will, where there are no legends, there are no annotations, and comparing that to a case where now you have a map of biology which is annotated in terms of patterns of movement, rivers, roads, traffic, political boundaries, in which you can not only begin to ask targeted questions, but then zoom in on detail and look at the dynamics of individual structures and how they function and malfunction in disease. And finally, we've already heard that all of these measurements are intermittent. It's not just uh, the case in studies, but I think it's fair to say it's the case in clinical medicine as a whole. And it's actually really weird. Everyone has a smoke alarm, but it's a bit like turning off the smoke alarm and then turning it on for only five to 10 minutes a year. Uh, you know, this is likely to work at a population level, but it's not likely to benefit any individuals. So we're investigating tools to engage with the patients and get outcomes that are more continuous through self-reported outcomes and other measures. Uh, so those are the features that uh, led uh, to the design of our study, which I'll go over a little bit. Uh, it's called the baseline study, and again, it's a collaboration between Google, Duke, and Stanford. And it combines this high-dimensionality molecular profiling and deep phenotyping with uh, longitudinal observation. And again, it's at the pilot stage, uh, so don't uh, uh, expect uh, too many results in the short term. So here's how we are uh, a answering some of the challenges of other longitudinal studies. Uh, fundamentally, it is uh, first by cohort design. Our study focuses on cancer and cardiovascular disease, but we wish to probe not just health, the healthy baseline, the uh, uh, line of reference, if you will, from which you can uh, produce the map of human systems biology, but we also want to probe the phase transition to disease. And to do this in a short amount of time, we have introduced a knitted risk cohort structure in which for each of the disease cases, there is a low risk cohort defined as having a low risk of having the disease or ever developing it according to validated risk metrics. Then there is a high risk cohort in which there will be a high event rate. They do not have the disease right now, but there is a high chance of developing it, uh, again, as measured by things like the Framingham score in the cardiovascular case. And finally, in each case, there's a recurrent cohort with a very high event rate. They are people who have had the disease, but unfortunately, they're at very high danger of a recurrence. And there we seek to look at prodromal symptoms of disease, where there's an actionable intervention, but also to make intercohort and intracohort comparisons in a short amount of time, in the first, say, five years of the study, as identified by the event rates on the uh, y-axis. And of course, each of these cohorts are stratified by sex and by age and race uh, as normal. Um, we are going to follow these patients every year, but we are also introducing to uh, make the follow-up uh, more commensurate with the time scale of generation of these events, quarterly interim follow-up, and more continuous means like a 24-hour portal by which participants in the study can report events and other outcomes. And so then we will be able to sample them in a targeted way, because a priori, we do not know, uh, as we saw in the uh, presentation about metabolomics, the pharmacokinetics of some of the markers that we'll be measuring. And uh, a, a, another very important feature of our study is our ambition to make it as deep as possible in terms of the molecular measurements. And really what we are trying to do is admit into the study analysis as many platforms for systems biology as can be industrialized. By industrialized, I mean we can control the pre-analytical variability tightly, control and measure it, ranging from the time that the blood is sampled or other bodily fluids are sampled, all the way into the automated analytical pipelines uh, that result uh, in data. And so this includes a lot of genomics measurements 
including gene sequencing, epigenetics, principally methylation, transcriptomics of peripheral cells, but also metabolomics, proteomics, and metagenomics to understand the uh, effects of the microbiome. Uh, there are also methods now which in our hands are, are being industrialized uh, and with collaborators to profile the immune system, which after all is a messenger of disease in a way that is much, much more detailed than has ever been possible before through sequencing and other methods. And all of this we seek to pair with an equally detailed schedule of clinical assessments that involves imaging where it's warranted, but also things like timed performance and cognitive tests to really build a baseline associating the molecular measurements with deep clinical phenotyping. And another feature you see here, it's already been alluded to, is that each of these molecular measurements, they're manifest over a different time scale. Some change over years or generations, others minute by minute in the metabolomic case. Um, so to take all of that data and put it together, it is of course very complex. They're multidimensional data sets with very, very different properties. And the most important new tool in our field making that possible is the one that you see depicted in the background. Uh, that's the data center, which makes it possible to gather all of this information, arrange it, and just arranging it for analysis is a task that shouldn't be underestimated. And then we hope to deploy on data of this kind the whole panoply of learning methods that have been developed for many, many other purposes, uh, but which can be applied to biological problems as well. And a good example of this, if you'd like to see our, our thinking in this regard, is a public project called Google Cloud Genomics, where you can right now store uh, genomic data. Um, so as I said, I, I just want to conclude not by offering any answers, but really framing some more questions for the discussion. We've already discussed everyone has how to empower patients because these and participants because certainly the quality of the data depends on long-term serial patient follow-up uh, and we should discuss tools to do that. But more in the omic space, our task is really to develop tools that enable the tight control and measurement of pre-analytical variability in a federated cohort structure while increasing the depth of these measurements the depth in terms of the number of things that we measure, but also the frequency of these measurements. And those are, are at odds, and they require a lot of design considerations to uh, reduce the level of noise in the system. And the final two things that I'll just mention is uh, that if we are collecting data uh, of this diversity, of this high dimensionality, uh, there have to be scalable approaches to exchange data, to assemble it, to present it, and of course to perform integrated analyses. And this data include clinical imaging and molecular data, and that is a great challenge. Uh, and finally, uh, we really have to understand how to actively engage with industry. A goal of the Precision Medicine Initiative should certainly be to reduce the distance between laboratory practice and clinical practice. Uh, and thank you, I look forward to the discussion later on. I think we're uh, only running a few minutes behind here. Um, so, uh, you know, hopefully this is, will be an audience, a, a opportunity to give the audience a chance to, to ask questions and have some uh, discussion up here amongst ourselves. So I'll just kick it off by, by starting with uh, a question. So I think, uh, um, Vamsi, I thought you raised a really nice point there at the end about rare uh, individuals with effectively inborn errors in metabolism as being an opportunity to go for targeted phenotyping. Right? And I think that speaks more broadly to the, oppor the opportunity that I think a lot of people see here for rare knockouts being a, a, a real strength or potential strength of, of this sort of initiative at this scale. So have, have you or I guess maybe even others in the audience given thought to kind of what one million would enable in that term? Like would, would one cover every inborn error metabolism, especially given kind of the outbred nature of our population? What would, what would be possible for, for not loss of function humans? I mean, it's, um, you know, obviously these types of uh, uh, calculations uh, and estimates have huge error bars associated with them. But, you know, I did uh, attempt uh, 
uh, one of the projects in my laboratory tried to uh, compile uh, the number of QTLs that are identified as a function of the number of study participants and the number of metabolites that are profiled, and that was that sort of trajectory that I had shown. And it, the latest study that was just published last year from a European consortium showed that if you profiled something like, uh, if you have genotypes and metabolotypes on about, about 10,000 individuals uh, in whom you've profiled 500 metabolites, you can identify about 100 gene metabolite pairs. And so if you extrapolate to a million, then pretty quickly you are saturating uh, the genome. So I think it raises some really exciting possibilities about being able to sort of <coughs> reconstruct all of uh, human metabolism uh, uh, de novo. So I think just from a pure basic biology perspective, it's really exciting. Uh, and then from a rare disease uh, perspective, uh, we've already started to, um, we're very interested in uh, the thousand or so nuclear genes that encode mitochondrial proteins. And then with all of these latest exome databases, we've begun to mine them for you know, uh, knockouts, and, and, and one of our favorite proteins, for example, that's of completely unknown function, uh, it's actually not associated with an inborn error of metabolism, but it's a mitochondrial enzyme of completely unknown function. Uh, it, 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 we know that about, uh, if we were to, you know, do the, the, the million uh, exomes and metabolomes, uh, we would probably have about 500 to about 750 knockouts, which would then allow us to really try to understand the function of, of, of that pathway. So uh, I think these are really exciting possibilities, and I think the rare inborn errors are going to allow us to interpret uh, common variation as well. Questions from the audience? Yeah. Rima Dauk from the Duke Medical Center. Just a few comments to continue on what Vamsi has highlighted and the last speaker on metabolomics. Uh, number one, we do have a very active community that over a decade has really pushed the envelope in terms of developing tools, methodologies, and we are standardizing across centers and across sites, and the data is becoming of large magnitude. So I would say it is many of it is ready. The other comment I wanted to make is that there are consortia that have really tested the boundaries in terms of using these technologies in precision medicine, in looking at variability of response. A partnership between the pharmacogenomics and the pharmacometabolomics communities that were funded by NIGMS has enabled us to show that indeed there is a metabolic imprint or a signature can inform about drug response phenotypes. We can subclassify individuals, people who are resistant to, to treatment, with antidepressants, people who do not respond to antihypertensives as effectively, the uh, African Americans versus the Caucasians, and many, many examples that are already in place with over 30 publications to show that metabolomics is a powerful tool for drug response phenotyping and patient subclassification. And the last point is that the metabolomics, not only does it uh, capture and reflect, uh, gives a readout on the genome and the all of these uh, SNPs and variants gives a metabolic uh, a pathway context in terms of what is impacted. It's also a readout on the exposome. What we are exposed to is part of our metabolome and also the gut microbiome, where we have shown now repeatedly in disease and in drug response phenotypes, the gut microbiome, uh, uh, there's a co-metabolism between the, uh, the human and the, and the gut, uh, gut microbiome, and a lot of this biochemistry is already captured by some of the technologies that we have today. Uh, and I think uh, designing these studies to capture optimally what we can do with metabolomics is going to be a key, uh, a key issue. Other questions? Yeah. So I, I just want to, um, to uh, expand the, um, the concept of metabolome. Say who you just oh, answer. Yeah. Mike my, my Gaziano, um, Million Veteran Program. Um, uh, about the longitudinality of the metabolome, what, you know, if you're collecting a specimen, you get a you get the metabolites at a point in time. And, you know, con conceivably the metabolics changes over time. Um, would it would it be useful to think about uh, updating the the the, the biospecimens over time? Number one, um, and that it's going to add complexity to the to our understanding of of the metabolome. And then second is, can we use uh, health data um, to, to make some inferences about the metabolome over time. What I mean is laboratory data from a, f 
from uh, a, a health system that has 10, 20 years worth of lab data. So, um, you know, the first question, I mean, obviously the more samples one could collect and bank, I mean, I think it's obvious that that could only be uh, useful. Um, we, we've thought a lot, and we've had a fair number of projects over the last decade aimed at looking at sort of fasting samples versus fed samples, baseline versus exercise induced. Uh, you, you learn a lot of information from these types of perturbations, that's for certain. Um, but there's something very valuable about the fasting plasma sample. And in one of our studies of a rare inborn error of metabolism that's common in the French Quebec, we only had about 11 patients versus 11 controls. And uh, the controls were matched for uh, age, uh, BMI, and gender. And when we did the metabolomics, uh, we could uh, beautifully separate the uh, patients from uh, the controls. In that same study, we'd also subjected those uh, children to uh, a smoothie challenge. Uh, and my expectation was that that would help to uh, expose uh, uh, some uh, latent differences in uh, uh, biochemistry that with a stress would then, uh, uh, you could then expose. Uh, as it turns out, uh, those differences actually completely disappeared. And if you looked on a two-dimensional PCA plot, whereas all of the patients in the controls were perfectly separated initially, after they had the smoothie, they're completely overlapping, and it's not because of we're profiling the smoothie. What it's related to is the fact that fasting is actually the stress state. Um, uh, and, 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 and this particular study beautifully shows that fasting is, is, is a stress state. And so I think at a very practical level, there's something really nice and practical by being able to get just fasting plasma samples and uh, in, in AM urine as well. And these are two types of samples that are routinely captured in hospitals uh, anyway. Uh, but of course, if you can get more, then you can actually evaluate what the stability of the metabolism is over time, uh, look for various trajectories. And so more is better, but I think even if, one, if, even if one were to just have fasting samples, it's quite useful. Hey, uh, Rob Kaler from FDA, um, great stuff. But I do want to try to bring a dose of reality here to some of it, if uh, possible. I'm going to call Vic out a little bit, but I know you all have opinions on this. There's, there's, you, you've uh, mentioned uh, N dimensions. I mean, it's, you know, you've totally exploded the universe of possibilities here. It all seems possible, but there are these little things about reproducibility and stability of estimates and um, multiple parameters leading to uh, basically results that aren't replicated in the next sample, and then you've got data structures that were brought up, and I guess the question is, are, are the data structures ready to handle the possibilities in a study where probably, I would guess, some politicians are looking for results, not at the end of our lifetimes, but, you know, sometime in their politically elected lifetime. So, I mean, the, the real essence of the question, though, is about data structures and whether you think what we have now is fit for purpose and whether it's possible there could even be convergence on that. So, Rob, I think you, you bring up two related points. Um, the, the first one has to do with the dimensionality and analytical variability, I think, in all of these methods. Um, and I, I believe that it's now uh, incorrect to say that metabolomic methods, proteomic methods, that their pre-analytical variability can't be controlled. It can be controlled. It can be standardized. There are large-scale projects, some of which uh, that you uh, described, uh, and some um, that are targeted uh, even to the disease states that I described, such as the EDRN project, uh, through which all of the contributors to these variable uh, factors have been enumerated and understood. Um, so I, I think it is possible to industrialize more than sequencing um, and to do all of these assays that we're discussing in a reproducible manner. Uh, the second question is about data structures. And uh, if you are asking if it's possible to take in this information and arrange it for analysis, uh, that's certainly possible. Every field has uh, its own unique way of arranging the data, but it's possible to arrange it for analysis. How to do these integrated analyses together, you know, that's an object uh, of study. And we don't know how to do that, but it should be something that can be determined only when there are enough examples uh, of such data sets available. Right now, there are a few, uh, such as the TCGA, which is a few that, that you mentioned, 
uh, where multiple data types are brought together. And we can see patterns emerging, like enhancements in statistical power, which are quite dramatic. But no one has attempted a very, very broad uh, integrated omics analysis yet, except in very few people. So we don't know uh, what the eventual power will be. Um, this is extremely fascinating examples, starting from genomics and metabolomics, and also uh, who announce here. My name is Govinda Raju, Raju Govinda Raju. I'm from Boston. I'm associated with Albert Einstein Medical College of Medicine. So here is genomics, metabolomics, and the phenomics, and then the. I believe there is a uh, it's a very systematic way of uh, dealing with things. Uh, so I think there is, a, uh, there is a need to take a step back the way Dr. Bajaj took a historical aspect, which I consider, for example, uh, what I consider here, what uh, these three speakers uh, spoke, is one Pearson uh, criterion. Second is, of course, the great Garrett's criterion. And the third one is Sewell Wright's criterion. Well, Exactly about a century ago, uh, Pearson said, diseases don't appear suddenly. There, there is, they belong to age and stage. So that is studied in terms of demographic genetics. Brian Charlesworth has written a phenomenal work, book on that. Second, uh, Child said, individuals are the ones who are, um, who are susceptible to diseases. So in order to study individuals, we have to go for families. And families, the population, these are hierarchically related. So this sort of thing has been really brought out um, uh, beautifully by Lewontin in 1970. And the third one is phenomics. All the three things are connected. This one was brought out by Sewell Wright in 1934. I think a little bit of historical, taking historical aspects to this, this sort of broad questions would be, would be helpful. Say, yeah, on the other hand, uh, say, supposing we say sequence one million. So there, I also, I uh, tend to ask, most of the times, the effective population size is only 10,000. That is the highest effective population size. Supposing we go for you know, one million sequencing, then we will be pulling all of them, then be, the data becomes that much messier. So these are some of uh, a, a few comments that I say from evolutionary genetics perspective. Perhaps uh, taking a deviation, taking a step back to the classical literature might shed some light. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, go ahead. Can, can I say one thing? Again, there are uh, a couple of ways in which such data are messy. It also goes to Rob's point. Many of them are under our control. The way in which we gather the data, the way in which we conduct the experiments, that's under our control. And the way in which we arrange the data for analyses and share them with one another is also under our control. The other ways in which the data are messy reflect natural biologic variability, and we should seek to explore that. Sorry, yeah, please use the mic. Sorry. <laughs> totally relevant. When I was on the other side of the fence two months ago, I was part of looking at what's actually happening. And you described that it's possible to do it. I don't think that reflects the current state of the science if you actually subject people's goods to the reproducibility test. So are you, are you talking about present state or future state? Um, I'm talking about the, the present state um, in the hands of very, very good labs that do a lot of this work, the work is reproducible. Uh, and I think uh, earlier in the evolution of any analytical method, when it spreads to multiple laboratories, you will see problems in the way that it's implemented. But you should not take from that uh, the lesson that it can never be controlled and standardized. Many of these things are not uh, done routinely enough to have been standardized. Uh, and one of our goals is to standardize and industrialize them and to work with the centers who have taken very, very good steps in that direction. Hi, uh, Pro O'Rourke Partners, Healthcare Boston. Um, at least two of you, maybe three of you, mentioned the importance of families and the value of trios, if not quads. 
Um, I realize we're here in a blue sky experiment. If the skies were a little bit more gray, would you cut families, cut total numbers, cut numbers of analyses? I just want to pin you down as to how important you think families and trios are to this project going forward. What, you mean we can't have it all? <laughs> Correct. Um, yeah. <laughs> right, we're still in, in the blue sky. I, I think that it is possible to some extent to, to have it all in, in, in this much that it, I mean, if we have a million people building in some family stratification will give us an advantage of being able to use that statistically um, while at the same time having the scale of unrelated people. I think with some of the uh, exome sequencing projects, we've seen the power of using cryptic relatedness, uh, people who, who don't necessarily know they're related, uh, but uh, in order to use that kind of uh, population stru substructure to help discovery. And so I think in, in as much as that goes, I think it's possible not to have to make a choice. But at the end of the day, I think it's relevant for the discussion that we're all having. I think if we add up um, the, the sorts of resources that uh, the Google X project is, is pushing towards single individuals and multiply that by a million, that's uh, an extremely large number. And so there are many other ohms as well. I think metabolome clearly is an important one. Um, I talked about genome predominantly, of course, but there's probably there are colleagues of ours around, you know, not here today who would push forward other, other ohms of the, of the, that they're, they're interested in. I think that uh, potentially, I mean, m my simple answer is that uh, I think we shouldn't throw away family. We should prioritize it. But, yeah, Francis. Francis Collins, uh, NIH. So related to that, uh, Vamsi, you talked about the value of having a birth cohort. One of the big decisions we have to make uh, about the precision medicine cohort is whether or not children are included, and you talked about a very specific version of that, uh, namely a birth cohort. Could you say a little bit more about what you would get uh, from that, from a metabolomic position or any other position, to help us sort of think through uh, what the benefits are of doing something which would be quite a challenge, but obviously something we should discuss? So Francis, I, I sort of included that at the last minute in the spirit of blue skying, and so we've had newborn screening in the United States for about 30 years or so. I'm not a by any means a scholar of newborn screening, but I know that these Guthrie cards are actually stored, and even if we don't include, you know, children uh, uh, within uh, this particular PMI, I wonder whether it's actually possible to enroll adults and somehow access even Guthrie cards that are actually stored. Um, that might be a complex issue, but um, it's actually possible to go back to these Guthrie cards. You just punch out, you know, a few millimeters, and there's a lot that you can extract from them. In addition to the 30 to 50 metabolites that one can measure for newborn screening, in principle, there's no reason that you also can't apply global metabolic profiling strategies as well. So it may be the case that this is blue sky and uh, regulatory hurdles will make this impossible, but I brought it up in that context. Yeah, I just have yet. a quick follow-up. So uh, we run Genetic Alliance, Sharon Terry, we run the nation's newborn screening clearinghouse, and it's purple sky because the, um, right now the, the new law requires consent from all parents to store the blood spot. Lots of uh, states have, have lawsuits against them and have gone through horrendous experiences destroying 5 million blood spots in Texas, and it, it's a real hot potato that I think, I, I love it, but I think it might not be the best. Can I respond? But I actually thought, Bamsi, that you were proposing that you have adults, so consenting adults, and then you go back, ask them for permission to go back and get their, their blood spot. So you're not taking unconsenting children's spots, but rather adults. Right, but, uh, well, and people have tried this. We've even activated some citizens to do this, and then the state gets in other kinds of trouble because they're going back, and, and for one thing, they haven't archived these very well. So it takes a lot of resources, and then, then the persons who want to uh, make conflict have actually targeted those states that we've reached out to. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah. So one, uh, one other comment on the metabolomics. I think getting the opinion of the community that is active and vibrant is key in terms of determining uh, exclusion or inclusion of some populations. Uh, number two, we know there are lots of confounding factors uh, this morning we were talking about uh, sleep and the uh, circadian rhythm, and uh, we know that the whole metabolic profile changes uh, throughout the day. So uh, issues to consider, when do we collect these samples? Do we have more than one sample? And uh, a last point in response to Rob Califf's well-taken point, are these technologies ready, some more than others? So if we were to do a, an open platform, open profiling, 
uh, most of them are not quantitative. If we are going to do a targeted analysis and measure quantitatively with use of standards and labeled isotopes, I would say that's great. Then we, we can measure uh, maybe a few hundreds. I just wanted to return to the microbiome. Uh, Joe Handelsman from the White House. Uh, there was already a comment about the microbiome, and I was surprised that it was covered as little as it was, because I know some of you at least work on it. Uh, but it seems like it might be a, a very powerful measure of a snapshot in time, but also predictive of disease. And so the microbiome changes throughout life. It changes on a daily basis. But there are some core elements that are much more robust to uh, environmental influences and live with people throughout their lives, it seems. So it might provide the both what genomics offers in terms of long-term potential for disease or health and what metabolomics offers, which is a snapshot in time. But the, the thing that I think distinguishes it from all of these methods is that it can be manipulated and it is causal. Um, so we don't know all of the correlations that will become uh, causalities, but we certainly know that manipulating the microbiome of animals, and in some cases humans, change the health status. So it seems like there's a, a double advantage that you, know, you can't change the genome uh, certainly as easily, but you can change the microbiome. So for the record, I did have the microbiome on one of my slides. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I do, th I, I think there's something special about the metabolome relative to the other ohms. Uh, in addition to the fact that sort of urine and, you know, plasma, they actually represent fluids that have effectively trafficked through every single organ in our body. There's something appealing about the fact that they have transited and visited every single site within our body. On top of it, you know, there's, um, we really don't understand the grammar of the genome, uh, but th there's, there is one sort of uh, model that's long been studied, and that's biochemistry and biochemical metabolism. That's a model that allows us to understand genes. And it's a model that allows us to understand chemicals, and those chemicals are often studied in the context of clinical medicine. So I think there's something special about the metabolome, and it does integrate the microbiome as well as the food that we eat, as well as the medications that we take. We don't know what all of the metabolites are. Many of the peaks that we identify using what's called discovery profiling are still unidentified peaks. Some of them probably correspond not to things that are made within our, made, manufactured by our genome but are probably absorbed by the gut microbiome. And there's ample, you know, uh, things like uh, B12, for example. There's plenty of uh, vitamins that are, vitamin K, for example, are made by our gut, gut bacteria. Metabolomics is a technology that holds the potential to profile the output from the gut microbiome. What's your experience uh, in terms of how many metabolites look human, how many look plant, and how many look microbial? Jeremy Nicholson in England has suggested that more than uh, three-quarters of the disease predictive metabolites that he finds in urine are actually of microbial origin. Is that what you see? The latest technologies that uh, we're using for metabolism, what's really cool is it used to be the case that we would do targeted profiling. So we would actually tell the instrument, look at these 50 or 200 metabolites, and we turn on the blinders to everything else. There have been really uh, uh, powerful new advances uh, uh, fall into the category of exact mass, mass spectrometry, uh, that now allow us to do what's called untargeted data acquisition followed by targeted data analysis. And so when we profile um, plasma, we probably pick up about three to 4,000 peaks, uh, and of those, we've included standards to begin with for about 600 to about 1,000 of those metabolites, and those are almost by definition endogenous metabolites. So there's still uh, 3,000 other metabolites that are there. We see peaks. We don't know what they are at present. I'm, I'm speaking from our own experience. Hi. I'm uh, Jen Madsen with uh, Arnold and Porter. Wanted to just go back for a second to the, the issue of standards and um, just note that with respect to the standards for the, the quality and reproducibility of the results that come out of um, the sequencing analyses, that there are several different standards uh, development processes that are ongoing, and that some of those are being driven by 
uh, the scientific community and the research community, some are being driven um, by payers. And uh, so to the, and then, you know, some of them are, you know, be for sort of, you know, rapidly evolving also. And so to the extent that um, this initiative could uh, identify standards that were sort of um, uh, neutral, if you will, with regard to uh, payment incentives in the, in the system for um, technologies that are being used in clinical medicine, I think that that would be uh, probably a valuable thing for public policy. The, uh, the coverage and reimbursement um, piece is kind of a, a, you know, its own separate swamp. And in order to, you know, um, ultimately make any of this clinically relevant, you need interoperable electronic health records. And um, as far as the laboratory goes, that's sort of a big um, looming uh, non-existent thing, too. So another public policy issue that might be worth um, thinking about if, as this moves forward, because the um, ability to address that would create the infrastructure to allow this to move forward uh, and, and be relevant and, and connected to the rest of the healthcare system over time. Okay, so I've, I've got a question of my own here. So, and we're getting close to the, I think we have about 10 minutes left. So, um, so, so I think as some of the questions have raised, not, not all of the omic methods have gotten equal uh, time up here, so to speak, right? And, you know, broadly speaking, you know, we have, of course, the metabolome, uh, the microbiome, uh, immunoprofiling has, has not been mentioned too much. Maybe it was on one or two of your slides. Uh, RNA expression, cell free nucleic acids, both RNA and DNA. So, you know, given that the session is kind of about scientific opportunities, I'd be curious just to know what, you know, if you had a fixed budget for, assuming we were, you know, the genotyping part of things was taken care of, and you had a fixed budget for omics uh, in terms of phenotypes, where would your uh, enthusiasm be highest? And if the answer is the metabolome, you have to at least give your number two and number three. So, <laughs> so that's really for all three of you, if you want to start. But. You want to go ahead? Yeah. yeah. Well, sure. I, I'm not sure what you're giving me, though, in terms of the genotype. You said genotyping. Let's mean, say I get you a, have whole genome. I get a chip, or I get whole genome sequencing, and everyone with 100% coverage of all the medically relevant. Fifty dollars. I get right for fifty dollars, and then it's what? Well, okay, good. I, I like this world. Um, so actually, I, and Russ may mention this when he talks later, but knowing that I was coming here, I asked Mike Snyder this question. He's not here, and, and he gave me a voice to present uh, to the future. He has, uh, was described by our dean once as perhaps the most studied organism on the planet. Um, he, he had studied himself with a variety of different omics and uh, has been involved with this project too. I think he, um, I, and I, as a neutral party here, I can say he did mention metabolomics actually pretty high up the list. So, and he has done methylomics, transcriptomics, microbiomics. I think microbiome was his second one. So I think actually we've probably, uh, and, and these are certainly, I think I would vote with my feet probably in that sort of a, a direction as well. I think I would love to have the transcriptome of every, of every tissue, but clearly biopsying every tissue is not uh, really something that will be very popular as a, as a study section um, request. Um, so, so I think that would be, and given time, I think I'll just, those, those would be my choices. Can I add to that? Because uh, I have Mike's message here. Yeah, okay. he, got, he was desperate to send this message. So after the genome, the t and I will take the slide out of my talk so I don't waste I, your time. Introduce yourself, Russ. Uh, Russ Altman from Stanford, friend of Mike Snyder, most studied human on the face of the earth, most self-studied human as well. <laughs> so after the genome, his most valuable in order, so this is not David Letterman, this is number one first, methylome, though very expensive, microbiome, 16S, cheap, Transcriptome, metabolome is four, but he says cheap, but tough to interpret right now, likely most valuable in the long run. And number five is proteomics, some new technologies fast and not too expensive once the equipment is purchased. So that's from Mike Snyder. Uh, thank you. Hello, <laughs> Mike. Yeah, through the, through the three folks. With, oh, you want to comment on that? I, or, just yeah, want, okay. I just wanted to comment on uh, 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 Dr. Mutas. Um, work, um, comments on metabolism, metabolomics. As it turns out, um, outside, sometimes, occasionally, when you partition the variances, genomic variance, metabolomic variance, and also phenotypic variance, occasionally, 
uh, uh, variance due to metabolomics is at least twice, two times higher than the variance due to genetic um, components and due to um, uh, phenotypic component. It, it was this um, was emphasized none other than Sewell Wright in his 1934 paper and also 1916 paper. And then um, uh, after that, various people have demonstrated uh, this fact, but unfortunately, I don't think I have seen in the recent literature. Thank you. Okay, so why don't we go to Vamsi for his number two and three? Uh, you know what his number one is. Sure. No, I, I do think that there's a qualitative difference between the metabolome and the other ohms. Uh, uh, I actually think that things related to RNA and protein, perhaps those could actually be studied pretty effectively in uh, cell culture, and they're so proximal to the genome, I don't know if we're taking full advantage of the fact that there's a living human before us that we have the opportunity to sample. So that's a re So I would place, uh, number one, the plasma metabolome, and number two, the urine metabolome. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and if I had to have a number, and, and a number three, I really like Ewan's idea of actually um, uh, uh, things like faces. I actually think that there's a, a tremendous opportunity to do sort of uh, anthropometric uh, genetics as well. It just seems kind of cool in sci-fi. Okay. Right, Vic? Um, so th this is an easy question for me to dodge in some ways because this is exactly the subject of our pilot study. Uh, to try to understand at least the instrumental and technical contributions to that question. So I would say first it's very important to have a robust and validated biobanking strategy um, so that you can defer um, the decision about which particular assay to use, particularly as technology is improving. And then otherwise, absent any particular disease or disease hypothesis, I think it's important to consider how the choice of assays covers in space and time the biological processes, and that's why I agree that uh, metabolomics would certainly be uh, first on my list, uh, and then uh, high-dimensionality profiling of the immune system in some way would be second. And third, uh, I uh, agree with Mike Snyder, uh, epigenetics, at least uh, methylation-based epigenetics, uh, is uh, important. Each of these has some uh, recent precedent where there's a correlative analysis that uh, has elucidated a disease mechanism in a novel way. Uh, and for each of these, the technologies are mature uh, and ready to be deployed at uh, population scale. Methylation of what? Well, uh, I, ideally, again, you would do it in a tissue-specific manner, but even methylation of PBMCs could be interesting. Uh, and I believe that's what uh, Mike Snyder meant. Go ahead. Yeah, I just want to, to, to go introduce back. yourself. Sorry. Oh, in, introduce yourself. Yes, my okay. name is Erika Forsani. I am from Arizona State University, and my group uh, mostly uh, try to bring up uh, technologies uh, in cell phones. So I am in the mobile health area, and working constantly with uh, new devices coming out uh, to people's hands, and uh, those devices are being. Um, approved by FDA, so their accuracy, their precision is there. So I think those are a great uh, opportunity for us as researchers to bring into the picture. Because if we take samples, urine, plasma, you know, feces, okay, we get a, a, a snapshot in, in the time. But as uh, Rima from Duke just mentioned, right, there is a lot of variability that happens along a human being life, and that variability depends on the conditions. So I think there are great uh, mobile technologies out there that could be incorporating into this precision medicine as a fact of bringing more uh, free living conditions into the picture. Uh, the precision of medicine is increased uh, not only by the fact that those mobile devices are FDA approved, but, but by the fact that being on people's hand and the opportunity of people to get multiple points along their lives, that increased the precision and a bigger picture on that person's health. I'm personally working with a metabolic rate and respiratory quotient track it in people's life and I think uh, those parameters that can be easily measured through a simple breath analysis, it could be a, a great opportunity. 
So mobile health, I think, should be brought into the picture. Okay. So since we have, uh, this is Rick Lifton, hi. Uh, since uh, I'd like to ask you, so our traditional epidemiologic models have really focused on cardiovascular disease, predominantly, not exclusively, but we've done an incredible job of identifying risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Surely there's more to be done there. But if you think about areas where there's prevalent disease with a lot of impact, that we have very few predictive uh, biomarkers, a few that come to mind, uh, obviously cancer, and I'm interested in your thoughts about plasma DNA. There's very interesting studies about potential for plasma DNA as biomark early biomarkers for development of uh, malignancy. Uh, and second, uh, rheumatologic disorders where we're beginning to identify, you know, we've identified therapeutics before we've identified uh, biomarkers in uh, several cases, and this seems like a, a second opportunity. And then third, neurodegeneration uh, uh, broadly as areas where we have very few predictive uh, biomarkers uh, at present, particularly for early disease. So I'm interested in your thoughts if you were thinking about trying to devise approaches to uh, come up with predictive biomark, preclinical predictive biomarkers for these diseases. Thinking about the types of omics that you've been discussing, would you change your priorities? Well, I, I mean, I think that's a really good point. When we think of like unexplained disease, or when I think of unexplained disease, I, my mind often goes to the immune system next. And I think that um, that we, we have a really rapidly changing ability to profile it. I think we can profile the immune system through DNA, as you mentioned, not just cell-free, but of the white cells themselves, either the transcriptome um, or in, in, for the, in the case of B cells, producing cells, uh, the, the DNA. But, um, but I, I think that... Uh, it's clearly the other methods that uh, these guys could perhaps speak to that we probably think of and that are scaling up um, as, as explaining more of that disease. Um, but I would like to see us use uh, sequencing also uh, to start to think about the immune system profiling. I think especially in a short read era, we've been quite limited even in, in, in defining the HLA region, which is complex, obviously, for short reads. But as we move forward with genomic technology, we should be able to, as a starting point, do HLA. And that's something that is worth, I think, thinking about in this project and then think about these uh, more rapidly changing technologies that these guys can speak to. Rick, I know that you're quite familiar with the notion of chemical individuality that Archibald Garrett first uh, proposed in describing the inborn errors of metabolism. Uh, and he basically uh, postulated that it's each of our own chemical individuality that actually distinguishes us and also uh, is a reflection of like the disease states uh, that we can uh, develop. Uh, in, in referring to the inborn errors of metabolism, he said that these uh, represent extremes of chemical individuality and rest of us represent sort of intermediates on, on a spectrum. Uh, I believe that um, a lot of the neurodegenerative uh, diseases, uh, they probably represent uh, milder forms of some of the severe inborn errors of metabolism, such as mitochondrial disorders. I think some of the genetics is actually beginning to support that, for example, mitochondrial dysfunction can underlie uh, co more common forms of uh, Parkinson's disease, as an example. And at least for the rare inborn errors of mitochondrial metabolism, there are some pretty darn good biochemical markers that can be assayed using uh, 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 newborn screening methods or metabolic profiling. So it, my expectation is that those same types of modalities might be able to pick up more subtle forms of neurodegeneration as well. It's a hypothesis, so I stand by uh, plasma metabolomics. I'll, I'll just add my two cents on the cell-free aspect. So I, I, I think this area is obviously taking off quickly, but there are still, I think, tremendous untapped opportunities uh, for cell-free DNA, not only DNA, but also RNA. Um, from a variety of collection sources and, um, and in, in cancer, but maybe outside of cancer, too. And I think uh, part, of the challenge, part of the challenge, I think we, we're still in the early stages of really understanding, you know, maybe just we need more basic science on cell-free DNA, its dynamics, where it comes from, when it comes from where, and so on and so forth to really get a better handle on that. But, you know, I think the opportunities are tremendous. Well, I think uh, we should bring this session to a close. I'd like to uh, thank uh, the speakers and our moderator, and we'll take a break until 3 o'clock. Thank you.
Okay, we're ready to rock and roll. Um, my name is Kathy Hudson. I'm co-chair of the working group and deputy director for science outreach and policy. And I am just going to introduce um, Mike Gaziano, who is um, uh, at the Department of Veterans Affairs in Boston and a principal investigator on the uh, Million Veterans Project, which we have been working very collaboratively with since we started thinking about the Precision Medicine Initiative. And he's going to be moderating this session on environment and behavioral factors in health. Thanks, Kathy. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here on behalf of the VA um, and, and Tim O'Leary, who sends his regards. Um, so last week, um, the Hubble Telescope celebrated its 25th anniversary. And um, they, in, at, in, in data terms, um, astronomical data took a tenfold leap in an instant. Um, and the last time that happened uh, in astronomy was when Galileo took the, the telescope and turned it up to the, the sky. And all of a sudden, the sky, instead of looking mostly empty, looked mostly full. And it, it created a, a revolution. And we're in, involved in that same kind of data revolution. And now Cisco, when they count bytes, they have to count the bytes that pass through these cloud solutions in zettabytes, which are um, I mean, a billion terabytes um, for, for each. So in this revolution um, is the the other revolutions that we just talked about, the, the, the massive amounts of data we're going to get from various kinds of omics. On the phenome side, um, we also is, are in the midst of a, a data revolution. Um, and so there'll be multiple ways to collect that data, some passively through health records that are collected for other purposes, administrative files, and others directly from the participants. Now, um, in some of those um, classical cohorts that I've, that I've had the pleasure of working in, I've actually worked in all four of those that Dick showed um, on his, at one slide. We did it very painstakingly, one at a time, with a research investigator. Now we have an opportunity to collect it a little bit differently. But I do want to you know, um, uh, introduce just a little caution, cautionary note. Um, in, in a very early aha moment I had as a young cardiovascular epidemiologist in Boston, working in East Boston, um, if you ask an elderly East Bostonian, if they tell you they've had a heart attack, what percent of time are they correct? Any idea? It's about, it's about 25% of the time. Now, from their perspective, they, they end up in the hospital, they, it was their heart, and they uh, um, got, went to the ICU, and that was a heart attack. Now, in the physician's health study, um, when we ask physicians, we, are, we confirm that about 75% of the time. So the, the quality of the data um, can be very different depending on, on where it comes. Where it uh, comes from. We've got three very interesting talks, each for 10 minutes to stimulate our discussion. And I will um, turn the podium over to Marie Lynn Miranda, who wears many hats at, at University of Mi Michigan, who's going to give us some insight on geo geospatial approaches to integrating relevant data. Thanks very much for the introduction, and even more so, thanks very much for asking me to be part of this panel. It's really a privilege. <coughs> Uh, so I'm going to start by just laying out a very uh, simple con uh, multidimensional concept of health, which is this notion that health is a product of uh, multiple factors. So think of it as a triangle. On one side of the triangle are host factors like personality, genetics, age, health status, comor comorbidities, those sorts of things. We've been talking quite a bit about those. Another side of the triangle is social factors we can, which can operate at the household level or the community level. And a third side of the factor is environmental factors like air pollution, the quality of the water, the built environment, those sorts of things. And all three sides of these triangles sort of push in on the people who live in the middle of that triangle and lead to particular kinds of health outcomes. And while we've spent a lot of time, I think, uh, so far today talking about that host factor side of things, I think it's really important to make sure that we, within the Precision Medicine Initiative, we spend a lot of time thinking about social factors and environmental factors, which I would say we, we need to be thinking about the exposome in, in, in addition to some of the other ohms that we've been talking about. And as we think about the exposome, I really want to emphasize as we think about selection of people into the cohort, that it is still the case today, as evidenced by the many social uh, uh, disruptions that are occurring across the country, that people of different races and different income classes do not live in the same places in our country. So the kinds of exposures that people experience are fundamentally different and deeply connected to the types of 
uh, to their socioeconomic status as well as to race and ethnicity. And as we think about the formation of this cohort, if we really care about solving health disparities, we have to remember that. So if we want to characterize the exposome, I would posit to you that a very nice tool that we have available to us is something called geographic health information systems. By geographic health information systems, I mean linking health system and other kind of medical record or experimental data that you have and link that to social and environmental data via shared geography and via shared temporal stamps to get this multidimensional understanding of the individual and the community and the context in which they live. So let's not just understand people by the data you collect in the exam room um, or in, the, in your participant interaction. Let's understand them within the context in which they live. Uh, so the components that go into creating a really good geographic health information system is connecting previously unrelated data sets, uh, building a really good data architecture, uh, doing statistical analysis that is both spatial and aspatial, always thinking about what are the spatial dimensions of the problems that we're working on here, and can we use the spatial structure and the spatial dependence that underlie the data that we collect to ex exploit that to extract new analytical insights. And we can, we can with GIH, GHISs, we can construct risk algorithms and market segmentation. Uh, this is a photograph that many people who do uh, geographic health information systems use. Um, and yes, we all believe that we are spatial. Uh, but what I really want to emphasize as well is that there is a tendency to think about ge geospatial health informatics as GIS software, right? So in the same way that finance is not Excel software, uh, geospatial health informatics is not GIS software. There's a lot of analytical capabilities and important things that we can do. Uh, so four basic observations related to geographic health information systems is that health is spatially patterned, contributors to health are spatially patterned, healthcare resources are spatially patterned, and the geographic scale at which we examine problems matter. And I'm just going to go through a, a series of, uh, if you will, eye candy to make each of these four points. So health is spatially patterned. If I showed you the prevalence of Medicare fee-for-service beneficiaries who are 65 or older and who have six or more chronic conditions by county for the whole United States from 2012 data, this comes from CMS data processed by the CDC, you could probably start to picture in your mind what that map looks like. So it looks like this. Uh, if you don't think that health is spatially patterned, if you don't think there are health disparities in our country, all you have to do is see one map like that to convince you. So spatial health outcomes are spatially patterned. Contributors to health are spatially patterned. So on the left-hand side, you see the percentage of the population that lives, is living in poverty in the United States. And the right-hand side, you have the percentage who don't have a high school diploma. We know those two things uh, go hand in hand, but just take a look at this picture right here and take a look at this picture right here and that gets back to my whole point about uh, people of different uh, demographic backgrounds don't actually live in all of the same places in our country. So healthcare resources are spatially patterned. This is a, uh, some analysis done on eye care providers in the state of North Carolina um, and that the it gets at uh, from the the uh, light colored pink is high access to eye care providers and the dark red is low access to eye care providers. And one of the interesting things about this is that the top map is, it uses all the same data, but the top map uses one geography and the bottom map uses a different geography. So the top map is by zip code, the bottom map is by census block um, tied to the centroid. And you see different patterns depending upon um, what are there. but the which geography we're using to do the analysis. But the most important thing here is that the resources, the access to the eyes, those eye care resources, there's spatial, spatial patterns to that as well. So the fourth observation is that geographic scale matters. So you see a lot of conflicting results in, li in the literature in, say, for example, the environmental justice literature or the health disparities literature uh, regarding uh, 
conflicting results regarding what things are important. If you do careful reanalyses of those data, what you can oftentimes find is that the analyses were done at different spatial scales, and if you actually take the same spatial scale and apply it consistently across the different data sets that are used, you get a sort of reconciliation of all of the results. So being very deliberate in thinking about the spatial scale at which we might want to do um, analyses, which is something that geographic health information systems lend themselves to, because you can pick your scale, do your analysis, pick another scale, do your analysis, pick a third scale, do your analysis, and then see how those things match up. And that, in, that process in of, a, in of itself um, gives you some uh, interesting insights. So this is primary care provider accessibility at the state level where low access is in dark colors and high access is in lighter colors. Um, so if I look at it at the state level, there's, we, I start getting one sense of what the spatial pattern is like. Uh, if I look at it at the county level, <coughs> excuse me, if I look at it at the county level, then I start seeing a slightly different spatial pattern. I also start to see that counties in the um, Intermountain West are a whole lot bigger than counties are east of the Mississippi. That's interesting. Um, but then if I do it at the ZICTA level, which is a census group, uh, is the U.S. Census's uh, slight perturbation on zip code, so, but for purposes of this talk, you can just think about it as a zip code. You can see that there is actually a whole lot more variability. If you could see it on this screen, you would see the variability even more than the projection. And that green is the place where there are no ZICTAs, and that's basically publicly held land in the, in the West, and that's why it's, it's not showing up in, this, in these patterns. So, you can, so once you start sort of zooming in, you see a lot more variability going on. So I'm going to give two examples today of geographic health information systems and the importance of the exposome. So the first one is on air pollution effects. So the US EPA collects monitoring data on a whole series of different um, air pollutants, um, but in many places there's only one monitor in a given county. So using the air pollution monitoring data doesn't necessarily help. If I use the modeled air pollution exposure estimates that the EPA also produce, those are typically done on, these are these fused data which are typically done on a 12 kilometer by 12 kilometer grid. And that's also a pretty big geography when you think about, um, if you think about traveling 12 kilometers in a given geography, how different are the neighborhoods that you've moved through as you've traveled those 12 kilometers. Um, but so we, we so there's a group of researchers who have looked at, well, maybe if you used road proximity um, as a uh, proxy uh, for multiple pollutants associated with mobile source uh, emissions, um, and then you can actually get at the appropriate scatial, spatial scale. So there's an analysis that was done, for example, on the road network in North Carolina, looking at what the Department of Transportation classifies as A1, A2, and A3 roads. I won't go through all the details. But the bottom line message was that th from this work was that roadway proximity uh, increases the risk for adverse birth outcomes. So this was a study on preterm birth, low birth weight, very preterm birth, very low birth weight, and small for gestational age. So being, living very close to a road increases the risk for adverse birth outcomes. And these were also patients who, upon, um, for whom there was, uh, there, there were, there were, uh, <clears throat> biological samples available for genetic analysis, and there were a series of inflammatory markers which were also associated with adverse birth outcomes. Interestingly, the biggest effect in the, in the particular study was looking at the interaction between particular inflammatory markers and roadway proximity. So it was that gene by environment effect that had the biggest um, and most dominant impact on adverse birth outcomes. So again, the um, exposome becomes very important for us to understand health outcomes. Uh, there is this wonderful study that Frank Gilliland's group at USC did uh, that was just published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which I believe makes a very strong argument for longitudinal studies where he looked at uh, kids who were enrolled uh, between ages 10 and, and tracked for four or five years in three different waves, so three different groups of kids each track for four or five years. And what we saw was as the Southern California um, air quality improved over this uh, extended time period, 
we saw, an we saw an improvement in lung development in the subsequent waves of these cohorts. So a good argument for the importance of the environment in explaining health, and also I think a good argument for doing longitudinal, longitudinally tracking people and being careful in our characterization of the exposome. The second example I'll give is from the Southeastern Diabetes um, Initiative. Uh, this, the goal was in, the goal for this particular project, it was funded through one of the Healthcare Innovation Awards. The goal was to hit the triple aim, improve healthcare delivery, improve health outcomes, and reduce costs. And there are four collaborative sites, um, in, uh, two sites in North Carolina, Durham County, North Carolina, and Cabarrus County in Western North Carolina, Quitman County in Mississippi, which is in the Delta, and Mingo County in West Virginia, which is in Appalachia. Um, I don't know where Rob Califf went, but uh, Rob and I were, uh, uh, there he is. Uh, Rob and I are co-PIs on this particular uh, study. Uh, so th th the study was sort of motivated by geospatial analysis, something like this. So on the left-hand side, uh, we took, for example, in Durham County, just taking all the Duke Health System data, we looked at the percent of Duke patients on the left-hand side who had five or more ED visits in a single year, and you can see there's a clear spatial pattern. Then using the same legend, on the right-hand side, we took only the diabetes patients, so there are about 14,000 diabetes patients in the county, and we said, if you only look at the di diabetes patients, what's the percent that have five or more ED visits in a single year? So both the left map and the right map are spatially patterned, and the fact that the right map deepens in color in almost every, every subgeography indicates to you that there is much more heavy use of the emergency department by patients with diabetes than elsewise. And of course, we never really think that um, excessive and extensive use of the emergency department is a particularly good sign of how well our health systems are working. So this led us to try to come up with this combination of medical and social risk, where social risk is really social and environmental risk from exposures and those sorts of things where we combine information from an electronic health record with information that's connected via shared geography on social factors and environmental factors from that triangle diagram that I talked about. And the reason this is important, I oftentimes use myself as an example. If you, I am myself diabetic, if you look at my medical chart, you will see that there are signs of, you would, might be concerned because of potential brittleness in my diabetes, right? So, uh, but if you look at my social risk, you know, I'm married, I have really good health insurance, I have a great supporting support network of friends, I have high educational attainment, so I understand my disease pretty well, I have a rigorous workout program, I understand nutrition really well, so my, my social risk is very, very low and that swamps my medical risk. So I get annoyed when people offer me an intensive intervention to control my diabetes because, you know, it's annoying. Uh, but there are other people whose social risk is enormous and their medical risk might actually be quite a bit smaller, but there's, that social risk swamps their medical risk and makes them, in fact, high risk. So we combine medical risk and social risk, and the way that we get at social risk is using this geospatial health informatics to characterize the social and environment and environmental exposures, and we spit people out on an intervention spectrum from lower intensity to higher intensity. And the colors of these uh, diamonds are meant to represent the different uh, neighborhoods that people might come from. So you can see here on the right-hand side that there's a whole bunch of blue neighborhood people who are, uh, need a higher intensity intervention. So the way that the risk algorithm gets built is that we take data from 2010 um, to predict serious outcomes in 2011. We define serious outcomes in a particular way with a hospitalization or we think death is sort of a serious outcome. And then we validate that risk algorithm using data from out years, so we were out, able to do out of sample validation. Um, the data that we're able to use includes everything that's there in red, spatial data, including spatial data on social and environmental factors. We do not have omics data, but there's no reason why you couldn't include ex omics data. And I do want to put in a plug for epigenomic data. Um, and if I do a point map of this risk algorithm, it looks something like this because this is what the physicians asked us for. Um, those of us who do geospatial analysis didn't think this would be a useful map, and they said, well, what if you zoom in? And we said, we still don't think it would be a useful map. This is what we think would be a useful map for you. 
which is a risk density map, which you can then overlay with a whole series of resources from the community and begin to understand how could you actually attack things. So it's this combination of I have all this detailed information on people, I also know what their context is so I know how to reach them with the kind of interventions that might be helpful to them. So in terms of the uh, Precision Medicine Initiative and Geospatial Informatics, I would argue that it's critical to attach geography and a timestamp to all data, that we should be collecting data on activity space. We make, the op we make the mistake all too often of just using people's residential address and say, then we know everything. We really need to understand their activity space and the kinds of technological interventions from our phones and our watches and stuff like that can help with that. You need to invest heavily in flexible data architecture. When Vikram said the task of arranging data for analysis should not be underestimated, I had to add that to my presentation. I want to emphasize that. And think all the way from discovering causes and treatments to delivering intervention, and that's where geospatial health informatics can be helpful as well. I believe that the NIH needs to make some parallel investments. I um, and in, am in a little bit of disagreement with some of the people on the first panel about whether or not we have the investments um, that we need in being able to have the right data structures in place. I actually think we need more investment in that, and that's a place where the NIH could get, I think, a very high return on investment as well as in statistical methods development and characterizing the exposome and social correlates of health. My, uh, la so my last slide, I always like to end by thanking my family who helped me to be a better scientist every day. Um, and the reason this is super important is on the left-hand side is my daughter. I cannot be at this workshop tomorrow because my youngest daughter is getting her braces off tomorrow. <laughs> so with that, thank you very much. Thank you very much. We'll move on quickly to our next speaker. Um, Stephen Antilly um, from Northeastern University is going to tell us about novel health tech care, tech care technologies that we could use for perhaps collecting data as well as modifying behavior. All right, well, I'm, I'm really pleased to be here today. Uh, I just want to thank the uh, NIH's Genes and Environment Initiative and, and the NHLBI in particular for a couple projects that have allowed me to work on mHealth over the last couple of years. All right, so we were asked to uh, answer two questions. The first one is, um, what are the recent major advances in your field that were previously unthinkable and that could be deployed in the proposed research cohort? So the first thing that struck me about this question is I think it needs to be cohorts. And the reason is because I think if you're going to have a one million people and there's some sort of passive measurement where they're still going to have to do something, um, in order to make the technology work that's going to help us measure behavior, I think we need to ramp up to that. And I would argue you might, the numbers might not be right, but maybe 100,000 sort of people doing more lightweight measurement where they're a little bit more engaged. Maybe 10,000 people who are doing sort of intense measurement and lightweight intervention even. You might think of them as a volunteer digital health core, right? They really have on a mission to try to help the project more so than the other folks would. And then maybe 1,000 people where anything goes, testers, they'll, they'll go all, all crazy, do everything you need them to do. I think from a technology point, point of view for measuring behavior, this is going to be really important, where at the bottom it's a total convenience sample and then it sort of heads up towards a national, national sample. And if you have an idea then, what would happen is it would progress from the 1K people to the 10K people up to the 100K people, sort of getting refined all the way. And ultimately, if it's good enough, it makes it to the 1 million people. And I would say there might be a particular way you might want those ideas to bubble up, and that is that, that think of it as a marketplace where I can put those ideas into that place. There's tons of back and forth between the small groups of people in this marketplace. Testing, the marketplace has researchers on it, but also participants on it. And then if the ideas are good enough, a much smaller number make it to the next one. The 10K folks are then evaluating it, and you sort of work your way up, where a very small number of them ultimately make it to the 1 million, because those have to be really, really well proven, very effective, and very cheap, right? So you'd start off at the bottom saying, I have an idea, I haven't proven engagement or efficacy, and then I go up to the, I go up through these stages, and at the end, I've, I'm proving engagement, which I think is really important, as well as efficacy, right? So, um, I think that process would need to be totally open and transparent, and so the idea is that you're not restricted to entering the marketplace. If you have a good idea, you can start testing it on that small group of people where there's a sandbox for the new investigators that's really easy to get access to the data and start using it. Uh, that's not so easy to do these days. The conditions would be all the code, the technology, the surveys would be fully open source. That's what I would argue for, where consent and security, some of the touchy issues are handled centrally and people can sort of focus on the ideas. All the data that's collected would be available to everybody 
And so if you're starting off with this 1K group of people, you have a really rich sandbox to play in where you can start to test usability and feasibility of new ideas. So getting back to the question then, what are the recent major advances in your field that were previously unthinkable and that could be deployed in the proposed research cohort? So I think um, this, this makes me think, you know, there's sort of this barrier to science. I teach a course in advances to measuring behavior, and what we talk about is the elephant in the room in the NIH review panels when you're talking about behavior. And I have the students do the surveys that people fill out that drive most of our studies that involve behavior. And they look like this. This one's for sedentary behavior, and you have to estimate how much time did you spend sitting each day when traveling to and from various places. And what happens is the students start to laugh when they fill these out, and you become, if you fill them out, you become very uncomfortable. And I'm always surprised at how often NIH investigators have never actually filled out the, the instruments that they ask their subjects to fill out. Here's one on chronic stress, and it says you have to rate whether or not something's true, somewhat true, or very true for you at this time, and it's got a bunch of questions. And students always laugh when they see this, because if you try to go through this and do it, it takes quite a while, it's quite hard, but this is only half of it. <laughs> okay, so, so here's the, this is the problem for me is that the measures are really, really poor for behavior and we often forget that. And so the telescope was mentioned, right? When you create a new instrument for measurement, you, you, you accelerate science and in the telescope's case, we're looking at big things, we spend lots of money and we see things that are just completely unimaginable, right? And then you go to the micro scale and we have telescopes or microscopes and my daughter has one of these and she can investigate things for herself which is interesting to think about in terms of this project as a way to spin it on the behavioral side. Can you collect behavior on yourself and explore it? And maybe kids can even get involved, but then you get to electron microscopes and you see, again, amazing things that would be hard to predict. And then this is a group that sort of draws out the genome effectively, right? And we're trying to make sense of this sort of data. So at the behavior scale, sometimes I think, what if we had a behavior scope, right? The equivalent of a telescope or a microscope. We're going to see things that we didn't expect, and that's the exciting part. So relationships we don't expect, and, and mathematical or probabilistic behavior, patterns identifiable by computers, and simultaneous measurement across the typical health silos. And I think if we just simply reduce the noise on the measures, we're going to advance science dramatically. So if, think about how would, we, how would we create new measures with the, the, this, this uh, system. So you have people carrying around their phones, researchers, they might go to this app store, the one that's got the, the 1,000 people on it, download something to somebody's phone, and then their phone is sort of detecting a little bit about what they're up to. They're answering questions occasionally, and then the researcher can change those questions. And then the data is all sent back, and everybody can then explore that data and try to figure out how to make this measurement tool better, but the researcher then may also say, I'm going to send you something special or I'm going to give you a special tool to validate a new measure that I think is better than all the previous behavioral ones. So they may wear additional technology, this smaller group of people, and where essentially you're, you're getting the data collection to become a habit in their life. So they just keep doing it. And then you can test things like whether or not real-time feedbacks encouraging a client compliance and ultimately end up with new and better measures that are validated for behavior, um, things that you might think of as digital extensions to the NIH toolkit efforts for getting people to standardize on, on these various areas for, for behavioral measurement. Okay, and that might go on for years. So some recent advances, uh, I would argue for, I would say, are sort of out there that could be used, which is what we were asked. Improved behavioral measurements, measurement from objective activity monitors for physical activity, sedentary behavior, posture, sleep quality, even things like risky driving behavior are out there. Uh, most of the time you have to wear or carry a separate device, but, the cat, but in some cases the phones or smart watches would be good enough. And you get surprising results from that. So this is a pa paper from R R Troiano uh, from the NHANES study. And essentially what he, what he shows is that uh, uh, great care must be taken when interpreting self-reported physical activity uh, uh, data in clinical practice, public health, um, because there's such a difference between the objective measure of what, what the, the sensor worn on the body says and what people report. And you also find things like less than 5% of U.S. adults meet the physical activity guidelines when you actually measure what they do. When they report what they do, it's higher than that. So there are all sorts of example questions in physical activity and sedentary behavior, things like are short bouts of physical activity as protective against disease as continuous long bouts? We don't really know. When does increased dose in one part of the day lead to compensatory behavior later? What is the impact and frequency of change of sit-to-stand posture on health? There's tons of questions, I think, in various domains that we could ask, um, but there are advances in 
the measurement of, let's say, motion and the measurement of uh, contextual understanding from location sensing, things like phone location, and in particular, free and open databases of what's at certain locations uh, that could be used to understand when somebody's, somebody's in a place, what are they being exposed to? So this is right around my house, and when I walk my dog, my phone could get free from an open source platform information about the specific park that we walk in and whether they're walking past there, tennis courts, and that's a lot of information that could be used to better understand um, why I'm doing what I'm doing. Here's Bethesda, and it has the same type of information. The important thing is that you don't even need Google or MapQuest or anybody to give you this. It's, there are free sources that are actually pretty detailed to getting better that the computer could use. Another advance is measuring, could be in measuring social interaction. So using things like phone to place proximity, phone to phone proximity, keyword recognition, speaker identification, phone instrumentation, all of those things would give us a better sense of how people are socializing and interacting without really having them to, without them having to do a whole lot. They just carry their phone around normally. Another area of, of advancement is in um, measuring measuring behavior by asking. And I know that people think if the, if the phone is asking, that's a bad thing, but it's not necessarily a bad thing. It might actually increase engagement depending on how you do it. And you may be able to make it better um, by using context sensitivity to essentially lower the participant burden. So we and others do studies where we have the phone prompt and they ask questions. And these are mostly the standard questions that you get in behavioral studies. But you can also do things like context sensitive EMA where a, a child uses their Bluetooth inhaler and five minutes later they get a prompt. Or the phone is seen as not having moved for a while and so you prompt and say what was going on when the phone wasn't moving. Or in this case where they use a special interface that sort of chunks up their day based on their phone's motion and then they just click on it and basically fill in gaps and indicate what it is they were doing at various times. So in addition, you can think about things like low cost uh, methods of gathering data through computers that you use. So games. Uh, that could be low cost or just through typing, your normal typing on a computer, then may be able to assess mental state, mood, um, and, and gather sort of additional uh, daily behavior on states. So this would be things like monitoring cognition. This is from Misha Pavel and Holly Jemison, colleagues of mine, uh, a cognitive game example. They have older adults play it. They build up mathematical models of what's going on with the behavior, and then they see evaluation of sort of modeled scores is, is mapping onto the actual test. So the very quickly here in one last minute. Um, what, on the second question is what's on the horizon right on the border of possible and impossible that potentially made possible by a large national research cohort? So I think one opportunity is in something I might call PMI guidelines. So you have sensors and machine learning, behavioral science, and human computer interaction, and people's phones. So imagine that instead of a food pyramid, there's something called your, your PMI pyramid. It's based on your specific activity. Or instead of fitness guidelines, your PMI fitness guidelines. So you're gathering data on yourself, and those are probabilistic models of your current behavior, next likely behavior, your receptivity to information, your decision making, and maybe cognitive reserve, habits and habit formation. This is data from me, from our Genes and Environment Initiative, where I've labeled lots of things I do during the day. But if you go through day after day, I do the same things day after day. And if you look and you see here in the morning, I'm walking my dog, oops, um, I'm walking my dog somewhere on the right there. I'm walking my dog. The sensors won't know that I'm walking the dog, but why can't the phone, after it sees that pattern a few times, ask me, what are you doing? And I say, I'm walking my dog. And from then on, it essentially is gonna have a much richer model of what I'm doing. So some of these things we can detect automatically, but some of them we can detect with the help of people from repetitive patterns. So the key insight, and I'll sort of leave off with this, is if you shift from asking in a behavioral survey, do you ever do X, Y, Z, which is how we asked today, to there's X again, it just happened, why did it happen? It shifts around your whole perspective. And the, the thing I'll, I'll argue, you can ask me a question about it, is that a, if you want to design interventions, you need different types of information than if all you want to do is figure out re health relationships. And we need to build tools that allow us to design better health interventions. We know that only 5% of people are meeting the guidelines for physical activity, so then what? So if I have a really detailed model of that individual, perhaps I can provide them with something that's a personal, very meaningful value to them because it's so tailored to their individual life. And I think that may be another area where this, the PMI initiative could play a role.
terrific. We could put a sensor on your dog. <laughs> okay, our last talk is Saul Schiffman um, from the University of Pittsburgh, who's going to talk, uh, was really a pioneer in real world collection of, of data. So um, it's always tough to follow uh, Stephen Tilly. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of wearing two hats here, and I think they'll be reflected in my comments. So I've uh, done a lot of uh, mobile data collection, probably for some uh, uh, 30 years or so. Uh, uh, but I also am a health psychologist and study health-related behaviors, such as smoking, uh, overeating, uh, and so on. And uh, so I'm going to be uh, wearing both those hats. I'm going to take a step back and say, why mobile? And, and I want to reject, as I think the other speakers have and probably the, the working group has, uh, the easy answer, which is because it's cool and we can do it. Uh, but really because, as people uh, have already said, uh, that while, while the genome may be static, uh, exposures are not. And I think of behavior as the organism's way to affect the exposure, including the, in, the exposure to an internal milieu whether that's uh, being exposed to air pollution or being exposed to stress hormones or to the carcinogens in, in cigarette smoke. And importantly, and others have already made the point, these exposures vary over time and space. And by space, I mean literally geographic space, uh, but also social space, psychosocial space. Uh, and so it's very important for us to understand that. And, and the perspective of time is certainly important because uh, these sort of things are not static and we get a very poor read if we measure them uh, statically. And these things can't be banked. Uh, you can't uh, bank experience or bank uh, information. Uh, you, you can't figure out later when Steve was walking his dog. Um, it's tempting, I found it very tempting. In fact, I have a whole other talk I threw out uh, that would talk about all the different cool sensors uh, that are available, and I couldn't help it. I am going to show you some. Uh, but I think the point is more to think about what's the range, what are the dimensions of mobile data collection? And some of it is focused on the person, uh, if you will, on phenotype, but some of it is really focused on the environment. Am I in a, in a place with lots of particulates or lots of noise? Uh, the collection mode, and people have touched on this already, might be passive, which requires no effort on my part and can be continuous, or it might be something I initiate, which also means uh, that you, you are necessarily sampling my life because you can't ask me to be reporting data all the time. Uh, there is an important practical division between stuff you get from the phone, which I think is kind of the common denominator of mobile data collection, and from external devices. And finally, some of the data, particularly uh, uh, patient-initiated, is patient-reported data. And I would argue, as I think Steve has, that that has a continuing fundamental role, partly because it's sometimes just more practical to ask the person, but also because there are some things that it, with current technology we can't get some, any other way. We don't know how to tell when someone's in pain uh, other than by asking them uh, currently. And obviously there are lots of targets, and I think in fact a key point is that before we select technology, we need to think about what targets uh, are important. Um, I do want to talk about what's available just using smartphones, which are kind of the least common denominator. And to point out that the phone already, can, if someone is using a smartphone, it already contains a bunch of data that are extremely useful. Uh, and I important here, borrowing from NSA, we're talking about metadata. So we're not talking about reading people's emails, but just noticing how many different people they email or how much social contact they have. Uh, what I found a fascinating uh, piece of work that a colleague has done is that not by analyzing what's said or even the voice tone, but the spacing of conversation, uh, you, can, you can capture about 60% of the variance in a clinical judgment of depression. So just with metadata uh, about natural conversation, you can get an incredible read. Um, but you can also uh, ask the person to do certain things. So technology is developing that allows you to photograph your meal and that figures out very approximately uh, the macronutrient contents of that. Now, it doesn't necessarily know how much of it you ate. You could take a picture of the plate after you're done, uh, but it's a way improvement 
over having people try to keep track because, to use the technical term, people lie. Uh, the technology is now very well developed uh, to automatically code emotion from facial expression. And there's a huge amount of work that shows that fac uh, if in a deep evolutionary sense, uh, emotion is expressed in facial expression. Uh, we've shown it can be coded very labor intensively by human coders, uh, but my colleague Jeff Cohn has now uh, shown that you can do this automatically. Uh, so, it, so it's now scalable, and you can just have a person take a, a short video of their face. And here's the fun technology uh, slide. So uh, lots of things from skin sensors to uh, uh, pulmonary function devices that attach to your cell phone. Uh, those uh, cute little things there measure particulates in, in your personal space. So lots of possibilities. But again, it, it, our, our question should drive technology, not vice versa. I want to make a point that really has already been made, which is we need to be thinking about the difference between having data, which we could drown in, and developing useful information. So GPS data are now easy, cheap, every phone gets it. Uh, but obviously, as has been said, you need to understand what that space is. Knowing someone's latitude and longitude doesn't tell you anything interesting. Uh, I, uh, a former graduate student of mine uh, has done work on tobacco in particular, in which he related people's traversal of their space, naturally, to where tobacco was sold, tobacco retail outlets. And it turned out that had some prediction, but the big prediction came in interaction uh, with, a, with a, a momentary indicator of their dependence having to do with how much craving they were experiencing. Not important to get into the details, but the point is that we're seeing an interaction uh, between the individual phenotypic and probably genotypic characteristics and that specific uh, exposure. I want to transition now to talking about mobile intervention because uh, eventually what we want to do is not just study health behavior and health but intervene to improve it. And uh, I think that there's potential, well, let, let's step back again and ask why would we want to do this in a mobile way? Uh, for starters, because people are hooked up to their cell phones a lot more often than they are to a counselor or a physician. We, uh, I come from a psychology background, and we have a weird model in which intensive treatment means we spend an hour a week with the person, which is approximately a little less than 1% of their waking hours, and we expect that that hour is so good that we're going to change their behavior the other 99% of the time. And we underestimate how much our behavior is controlled by the local environment. So the fact that we can deliver it in the person's real life space is important. But more important is that that behavior and their condition and their environment change over time and space. And particularly if we look at health behaviors, they're mostly things we should do and things we should stop doing. And both of those have major environmental triggers and key moments. So I'm going to show you an example, but certainly you pass the ice cream store, you either walk in or you don't, you pass the gym and either you go in or go down to the ice cream store. Those are specific moments in specific spaces that are, that are the choice points, the divergence points for healthy or unhealthy behavior. So uh, I think of, of mobile interventions as having uh, uh, three generations. Uh, one is that we, if you're thirsty, we have whatever you want. You just come to our store and pick a drink. This is the web model, where you go there, there's lots of stuff, you figure out what you want, and you get it. But of course, it requires you go there, that you actually know what you want. Um, what we're seeing now with mobile interventions is that we bring the water to the people, uh, but often at random. So as you're walking around, occasionally your cell phone metaphorically dumps a bucket of water on you. There's your intervention. And what we need to get to, the aspiration, is to be a really good waiter who brings you just the wine you wanted for this meal at just the right time before you knew that this was the wine that you wanted. And so in a sense, uh, this is precision medicine brought to behavioral mobile intervention. And uh, a bunch of people are working on just-in-time adaptive interventions. The idea is, uh, to use sensing or, and self-report 
to understand the person's space, understand possibly even before they know it uh, that they need help, what kind of help they need, and then deliver that, and then ideally to learn from that experience, to not just deliver it, but find out what works and what doesn't. So let me show you a schematic uh, for a smoking cessation and relapse uh, intervention. So uh, you may know that within a week of quitting smoking, uh, uh, three quarters of the people who quit will be back to it. So relapse is a major problem. And we actually know a huge amount about the local environment that causes relapse. It has to do with mood, it has to do with cues, it has to do with drinking. Uh, and we know some of the things that work, that people can cope in ways that avoids that, but they often don't. So what we've been trying to develop is a, a just-in-time adaptive intervention uh, that tries to figure out when those moments are happening and deliver just the right information. So we're using information about the person, uh, phenotypically, about their recent history, about the current context, which some of which might be sensed uh, automatically, and their very, very local state. And we've been working with colleagues in machine learning to use that sort of information to actually predict, without the person knowing, that they're in a state of vulnerability. And then we generate an intervention that's matched. But the problem is we're not really sure which ones are good matches. So it's very important we then assess the outcome, and that goes back into the loop to learn which interventions work. And a key thing is that each one has a little micro-randomized experiment. So sometimes we give them the intervention we as experts thought was going to be great, and sometimes we give them nothing or another one so that we can really understand what works and what doesn't. So I think this is the future of mobile intervention. I, I want to just briefly nominate for our discussion some fundamental uh, behavioral processes that are important to health behaviors and that cut across specific behaviors, whether they be appetitive behaviors or others. So people differ both uh, dispositionally and in momentary ways in how reactive they are, whether to cues or demands, stressors, insults. There are huge variations in how much people are tempted to have the ice cream or not and how much self-control they can exercise. And those ladder up to concepts like resilience and, and grit. And finally, and others have mentioned the social uh, interaction and interaction, uh, that was supposed to say integration, uh, are, very, are known correlationally to be very important to health, uh, but those two can be measured in this way. Very, I'm going to wrap up because I'm told I have to wrap up. Ask me about sampling. Uh, but I do think, uh, again, very important that we not think of technology and think, oh, that's cool, let's figure out what we can do with it, but really work from uh, uh, theory and evidence about what's going to be important and be pretty assured that there's going to be technology or we can develop it to, uh, to measure that. Uh, and I think this does then, particularly if we're able to measure people over time in their natural life space, uh, really promise to unpack person environment and gene environment interactions. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I, I, I'd ask the three speakers to join me at the front table and just to go over a couple of <laughs> a couple of ground rules. Um, for your questions, introduce yourself. Um, please keep the, uh, the questions brief and um, pick your best question because we're going we're gonna to give um, everybody a chance before we circle back to any one speaker. Turn on your mic, Mike. Most of the time they give you the, the information you need. I think it's, it's wonderful to see how this, this data will in, integrate. And I'll throw out the first question. How, how do you see this, the, the, the interplay of these different kinds of data, um, the, the, the uh, telephone data and the geospatial data? Can, can they, can they complement each other? No, they, they certainly can. Again, that was the example I went through very quickly. Uh, Tom Kirshner uh, has done just that. So he gets the, geos he, he gets the GPS data from mobile phones but then he's done a very careful mapping, this was actually in Washington, D.C., of the, what for him was the theoretically uh, interesting issue, which is where are these tobacco retail outlets. He actually characterized them in automated ways, and then he was able to show that he could explain relapse, a certain part of the variance in relapse, by understanding the person's proximity to those outlets in interaction with their 
current state of, uh, of dependence. I would actually, I would also argue, I agree with you about um, sort of prospectively collected data with intentionality of getting the uh, geospatial location in. I, I do think there are all kinds of ways that we can take existing data sets and data sets that are collected for all kinds of other reasons and attach geography to them as well, and we should make that part of this exercise. <coughs> Rob Coe from, from FDA. Saul, I was really delighted to see uh, you uh, introduce God's gift of randomization into the uh, discussion. So, um, but it seems like what you're doing is um, you're not stopping every time. I, I guess you're getting broad consent and then you uh, are doing multiple types of randomization with different um, questions. I, I, I'd be interested in people's thoughts about the virtues of employing some randomization within a study like this? So what, what we are doing are, are essentially mini clinical trials within a person uh, in part to learn broadly what works but also to learn what works for them. So it's not so much a broad consent but we tell them specifically that uh, it's going to give you uh, uh, some uh, particular intervention. We don't always know what works so sometimes you know, it may at random choose one or another and that we're going to use that to figure out what works. So they have consented to the very specific process. Uh, but you're right that it's a different kind of randomization. It's not static. You're going to be in the active or control group. Uh, just, just a quick comment on that. I mean, I love the concept of the inception point is actually a, uh, the risk of having a behavior at a particular point in time. That, that's a great concept. Yeah, well, I think you, uh, Rob, you introduced another very interesting uh, and very potentially important point is the, the nature of communication with the members of the cohort is, I think, going to be critical. I, 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 don't, I, I think it's logistically challenging to, to consent every time you want to do some analysis. So I think you start with a broad consent to do, you know, your fundamental things. But the ability to recontact participants and engage in certain add-on activities um, is, you know, predicated on having a, a good rapport, a good communication, and now a mechanism to, to communicate potentially in real time. So they, it, it, the potential is for doing, you know, randomized kinds of experiments. I really liked the uh, the nesting um, that Stephen introduced in the development. Um, we we often do that in a pilot way and then move things more broadly. Um, and I think that you can think about the the utility of a cohort like this as uh, with with lots of uh, potential, um, and you don't have to, to think that you have to get everything on everybody. Um, there, there is going to be um, some selectivity in who's going to be able to participate in certain elements. Um, the UK Biobank is getting um, uh, the Fitbit type information on a week they send out a device, but they're doing it on 100,000 of their 500,000, not the in, in entirety. Um, but there, there are some challenges there too, and you know, we, we can't talk about using these mobile devices without talking a little bit about that, that, that element of selectivity. Um, not everybody has the same kind of mobile device, not everybody has you know, a smart device, and so there's that, that issue of the digital divide you know, has to, has to um, at least be addressed, and you have to understand what you're getting. So just a, a comment on that. I, I would say one of the opportunities here is to get away from this idea that when you measure behavior, you're measuring it in the, in the same way for all individuals. If you have a variety of bits of sensor data, you can often interpret that data better with little pieces of information here and there. So sometimes you'll just have one sensor, let's say it's a motion sensor, and you want to interpret everything, and it's very difficult to do that. But if you have an additional sensor, could be self-report, could be another type of sensor. Suddenly, interpreting the data becomes really easy. And so what I would love to see is that in this, in the way I put it, sort of the marketplace where things are bubbling up, that, that in terms of our measurement of behavior, people can propose ideas that initially the, the community may say, I don't, I don't necessarily think that's going to work. But then they can prove it on the small group that they can gather the type of data that people are interested in in a way that's acceptable, works longitudinally, intensive, you know, sort of intensive longitudinal data collection, prove that it works, and convince the community, and then it bubbles up, and then everybody benefits from that new instrument. Just to, to comment on uh, two of the things you said, uh, that was part of what I'd hoped to talk about in terms of sampling, is that you don't, you don't need a million people for every question. 
And uh, we can, depending on the question, pick random subsets uh, to participate in a particular kind of measurement, or probably more powerful, uh, strategically pick subsets that are interesting in some way. Absolutely. I mean, a lot of the time, you, you know, if, if you're studying uh, uh, smoking or air pollution, you can pick geographies or people or periods of the year uh, that are going to be more informative and do it, uh, do it on a subset. So I, I think we shouldn't think of everything being done on everybody. And, and there are uh, missing, missing by design designs mm -hmm. in, which, in which you don't get the same yeah, measures from everybody, but you have enough overlap to, to be able to put them together. I do agree that the, uh, the ownership of smartphones uh, has a, a socioeconomic skew. As I think about the expense of some of the things that were on the table this morning, I think buying people a, a simple Android phone uh, would actually be a very cheap investment. So there are, <clears throat> there are actually great examples of that. So the National Poll on Children's Health, in order to ensure that there's a representative sample, they, they do exactly that. They ensure that they eliminate the digital divide in that way. What I will also say is even if you eliminate the digital divide and you have all these great sensors, there's, for whatever reason, there's going to be gaps in the data that occur. So one of these places in terms of um, methodological investment. We, there's good work that's been done on imputation of missing data, but I think that additional work on good imputation of missing data is going to be important for this um, cohort uh, approach to be successful. Thank Colin. <clears throat> uh, Francis Collins, NIH. So one of the things I think we hope to get out of this very large-scale cohort uh, is both the ability to have lots and lots of people participating, but also the ability to collect data of various types uh, to try to tell the difference between correlation and causation. Uh, so Marilyn, let, let me ask, just in a thought experiment, you, you showed the data or told us about it, about adverse birth outcomes and how that's correlated with proximity to a road uh, in North Carolina. And immediately, I'm sure everybody was thinking, well, yeah, but there are other possible confounders there uh, that might have explained that. So I'm just thinking if we had every possible kind of data at our fingertips that might have played into that, would it be a better opportunity to figure out what's actually a cause? Is it really the proximity of the road, or is that actually a marker for something else that's causative? Help us think through that. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's interesting you pose the question that way, because that's exactly how my mind went through this, this set of questions. Uh, because one of the things about road proximity, it might not be proximity to the road, it might be the neighborhoods that are proximate to roads. And that might have something to do with income and that might have something to do with healthcare access. So we actually ran the same analysis using um, uh, data on the built environment and saw and, and were able to tease apart some of the differences between um, proximity to road is potentially associated with mobile source emissions and the quality of the built environment. However, at the same time, um, what those studies um, did is that they were fully integrated with a clinical obstetric study where we were prospectively, so that analysis, there was work done with just uh, vital records data, but we had a clinical obstetric study where we were prospectively recruiting women in and were able to collect a bunch of much more detailed data on them. And the results that we were seeing in the, in the human spatial epi and in the clinical uh, obstetric study, we had a matched animal study so that we could control a whole lot more and did sort of combine social environmental stress on animals. So, and using the same strain, so being able to control for some genetics and then using different strains of mice to, to look at it. So I actually think to really get at this, you have to triangulate amongst these sort of larger spatial epi. I love doing geospatial work, but that geospatial work, it's almost like a test bed and needs to get served out to clinical projects and animal model projects, and the results from that need to get served back to the geospatial work. But if you had had physical activity monitors on all of the people in the study, as well as measures of stress uh, and other behaviorals like smoking, where you had a, a much more refined individual database, I assume that would have been something you'd look at rather closely and see if there's something else that's correlated with that geospatial proximity to a road 
that might be part of the pathway towards an adverse birth outcome? Absolutely. So that, that's the reason why we looked at both proximity to the road and the neighborhoods that are proximate to the road. So those are two components of what you talked about. If we could parse through all of those different components with the type of data we're talking about generating through the Precision Medicine Initiative, that would be an incredible resource. Just a, a, a quick further response to that, because I agree with everything uh, you said, is that um, uh, studying people over time also gives you some leverage in correlational data uh, because those conditions can change and then you can see if the, if the outcome changes. Now, that's, it's still going to be correlational, uh, but you have a chance to uh, look at within-person variance, not just the between-person variance. So both the large-scale longitudinal aspect of, of this uh, initiative and at, in terms of uh, mobile data, the small-scale uh, time aspect gives you some leverage uh, to better use correlational data. So this is somewhat tangentially, but I think importantly related to your question, Dr. Collins, which is in, when, in work looking at adverse birth outcomes, we're constantly trying to explain why do blacks have worse outcomes than whites do? And the way that we do that is we enroll people into cohorts and compare blacks and whites. And in fact, in our country, blacks and whites live in different places. And they eat different foods, and they're, 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 there's all kinds of cultural differences. And our biggest gains in trying to understand adverse birth outcomes, I believe, come when we have cohorts of black women, and we compare black women with good outcomes to black women with bad outcomes because they're much more likely to have overlapping social and environmental exposures so that we can better parse out what the contributors are. Okay. Well, well this is... Um, uh, you introduce yourself? Yeah, Dr. Miranda. Well, my name is Raju Albert Einstein. I'm representing Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Um, Dr. Miranda and then uh, Dr. Schiffman um, alluded to this one. Genotype in, in the... In case of genotype environment interactions, most of the fitness traits, that is, the traits that make us live longer, the traits that live, um, uh, make us live, uh, reproduce more. So these fitness traits universally have about 30% heritability, meaning in 70% 70% of that, 70% um, uh, of these traits are influenced by environmental variation. So environmental variation, you suggested spatial variation. He suggested uh, clinical variation and other things. Those are the or the behavioral variation. Then your, we also change on a, on a daily basis, on, 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 on an individual basis, we also change our behavior in order to improve our fitness, either live longer or have more, produce more children. In such a case, then individual variation gets into the picture. How do we partition that the global environmental thing, that the air pollution and other things, and the, my, my own efforts or my own family efforts to improve my, uh, my fitness. Uh, so I, I, I don't know, is it, is it possible to incorporate that sort of thinking into this personalized medicine? Thank you. I, I, think, I think that's sort of the, the whole I idea, really, right? I mean, is if you have very detailed data on how much uh, fitness, how much exercise people are getting, how sedentary they are, and you can correlate that with the location information um, as well as other parameters, you can start to tease, if you have enough people, you can start to tease those things apart. And I think right now the measures of the physical activity, for example, are so crude that it's hard to get any information out of it. Um, and in this case, with perhaps in the end, much smaller sample sizes actually, much more precise measurement, much smaller sample sizes, you may be able to, to, to discover things that would be nearly impossible today. Thank you, Cindy Pellegrini with the March of Dimes. Um, the March of Dimes is very enthusiastic about this undertaking, and I'm sure it won't be surprising to know that uh, we think it's imp very important to include both children and pregnant women. But in listening to the presentations this afternoon, uh, I'm actually starting to think that children and pregnant women are the most important populations that we could study, because we are going to get such different information through different developmental stages, through, of course, the course of pregnancy, um, Children have different geographic locations, different exposures, different, um, different nutrition throughout the different stages of their lives. And of course, these we, we know serve as the fundamental origins of both health and disease. At the same time, though, 
based on some of the things that you're talking about, there will be special challenges in tracking this information, whether it's children's access to mobile devices. We know every teenager has one. But, you know, there's not much good self-report with toddlers, right? And, and surveys and mobile devices will be accessible to some groups and not others. So can you talk a little bit about what you would see as some of the special challenges of including pregnant women and particularly young children and how we could address some of them. I think as director of the Children's Environmental Health Initiative, this question just got punted to me. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so first let me take your premise about the importance of including pregnant women and children in the study. I agree with you. Um, I, uh, I think there are all kinds of things that sort of get started preconception, prenatally, and early neonatally that have cascading effects on health, and paying good attention to that is important. I would actually argue, though, that it's that uh, if I if I had to limit, if I started thinking about sample sizes and I had to limit to particular groups, I might actually also think quite a bit about people at the other end of the age spectrum because there are very particular vulnerabilities then. Um, and, uh, and it's not just length of life, it's quality of life. And maybe some of that gets determined earlier on, but I think some uh, concerted attention there is important. In terms of ways, you know, with children to, to, to measure all of this, it sort of depends on what, you're, what, you're, uh, what it is you want to measure and why you want to measure it. I would argue the most, the most important thing to be measuring is, uh, I believe, is pregnant moms. Um, and what their diet is like, what their exposome is like, what their social support system is like, um, what their uh, variety of different biomarkers, those sorts of things. And that doesn't, you know, they're, uh, you know, almost, well, <laughs> a lot of them are adults. Um, uh, so, uh, so pregnant moms is, are, are one thing. And then there's a whole series of attempts at NIEHS in terms of the exposome at NIEHS to have these um, sensor technologies that are applicable for children in the Children's Environmental Health Centers have a variety of innovations um, in this uh, regard. And rather than going through all of them, I would love to talk with you about this and uh, give mo much more detailed information about them. Um, as much as I'm sympathetic to studying children, both because, as, as you've said, there's evidence a lot of these important processes start early, and also because I have children. Um, I, I, I think practically, I mean, that's a 50-year project because the, the diseases that are the greatest causes of, of death in our uh, country right now tend to occur much later uh, in life. So I think from a practical perspective, uh, for a longitudinal study, particularly if you want to study the onset of disease or progression of disease, it makes sense to start with adults and follow them forward uh, with children, except for certain uh, diseases and causes of death, you would have to follow them for a, uh, I'll call it a politically impractical uh, period of time. So as we're um, wrapping up this section and moving to that, I'm just going to ask the, I'm going to ask in a moment, um, question of just setting priorities, and each of you can just, how would we go about sort of setting the priorities of the process? But the, the other question I'll throw out very, very briefly is um, just uh, partnerships with, um, with, uh, with industry, uh, potential partnerships as, as playing a role. I think you guys must, must work with in, in, that, in that space with the device makers. Um, and I think we need to, we need to get their input. Um, they, it has to be efficacious, as you point out, but it also has to be sexy. It has to be able to engage. I mean, lots of people are using Tinder, and we have no idea whether it does anything. Um, and it, its uptake is huge. But if, if, it, if it doesn't, if it's not easy to uptake, it's not, um, not, it's not going to be used. So, so I, would, I, I would say partnering with industry is very important, and if it can be done well, it can create a lot of opportunities. I, I would argue personally, though, pretty strongly that everything should be, be open, open source. I think in the physical activity community, there's a problem, and that's there, are lot, there are monitors, they're proprietary, mm. the, the, the algorithms that they use are not well documented. Sometimes they have errors, and the community is, has, has trouble with that, is struggling with that a little bit. So I, I mean, I, I think also in terms of transparency for the community, in terms of security and privacy and the things that are going to 
be incredibly important for this project. The more open it is and, and where people can go through, see exactly what the code does, exactly what the devices do, I, I would argue that that would be a very important thing to do. And I, I don't think that getting engagement is necessarily something that industry is needed for, per se. I think the reason that you have apps that take off is because there's this marketplace where people can come up with ideas and they can be anybody from a high school student to somebody running a business. They have an idea and then they can try it out in the marketplace. And what's frustrating in terms of health areas if you're trying to work in technology is that's very difficult to do. Um, to get access to cohort data is very difficult to do because people sort of hold on to it. To um, deploy a technology at a scale beyond 20, 30 people is difficult to do because you spend a lot of time developing it even for small groups and you don't have sort of a large group of testers that you can sort of easily get access to unless you go off and say, okay, now I'm going to start a company, right? And so having a mechanism by which researchers can experiment in a way that that, that people do when they're starting a company with flexibility to try new things would be really, really nice. Yes, that's clearly a priority. So very, to end, uh, just uh, Saul or Mary Lynn, um, priorities for you all? Well, again, thinking about what we already know about major causes, uh, I, I know cancer is the initial focus, uh, but surely cardiovascular disease would be close behind. Uh, there are some usual suspects, uh, tobacco use, smoking being top of the list, uh, dietary factors uh, probably being a close second, uh, and uh, both environmental chemical exposures and, and physical activity uh, having probably an important role. So in terms of targets, uh, I think those would be very important. The technology we use to address them, I think, uh, we don't need to discuss here, but, but there is technology. And Lynn. So um, <clears throat> rather than talking about a particular, so I agree with your list of things that we should collect, I'd, I'd put out a broad principle that we should be thinking really hard about attaching a geographic and time stamp on every single little piece of information we collect. Um, I think that there's a lot that we can do with it now, and it also falls into that category of five years from now, ten years from now, there's going to be even more. And if we don't attach a time and geographic stamp to things, it'll be a big lost opportunity. So I, I agree. That's a principle that applies to just about everything we collect. Well, I want to thank our speakers. I think So our next session is um, on uh, data, and Eric Dishman, a member of the working group from Intel, is going to introduce the session and be its moderator. All right, so we stand between you and the bar and the ice cream store, or the gym. Which choice are you going to make when we actually finish up this panel? Um, so this topic is big data. I know which choice most of us will make. So um, this topic is big data. If, uh, if you're tired of the hype around big data, raise your hand. It's, it's, if you know the Gartner hype cycle, big data is one of those things that's climbing up the Gartner hype cycle across all industries. And it's going to reach the top of ultimate hype, hype where it's promised to solve all of life's problems. And then it will come back down and we will st slowly start to integrate big data into uh, everyday life and everyday industry. And w how we do this and the sort of rise of big data is, is becoming a scaled thing during the time in which we're going to do this cohort. In fact, uh, I'm not a computer scientist. I'm a social scientist by training at Intel, but I've hung around them enough to know that I had to learn the words exascale computing. In about, 10, in about 2018, right, when I'm, and, and over the course of this cohort, we will start to move into the era of exascale computing. This is a billion, billion uh, operations per second, a quadrillion operations per second in terms of, uh, in terms of computing power. Um, this is an enormous amount of computing power. And outside of uh, some of the astronomy that was actually mentioned earlier as one of the metaphors and the kinds of precision medicine analytics that we're talking about, Intel can't find use cases to understand what the future of exascale computing needs to be. So this is a really rich place for us to understand the compute power needed as we go forward. And the last thing I'll say before we get started here is um, what is big data, right? It's, it's, it's so uh, hyped and talked about. For us, the very simple way, and this plays well to the English major and me, at Intel we talk about velocity, um, variability, or variety of data, and volume of data. 
And I think the kinds of use cases that you started to hear about today, you can imagine a high volume of data in many cases, sometimes a high volume of very large files um, in the case of genomic and other omic data sets that are there. Um, but the variety of data coming together is, is going to present challenges to everything from machine learning to the architecture of databases um, to computing itself. So to that end, we've got three great speakers here, as with all the other panels, 10 minutes for each one, and then we'll um, bring together the group to have a discussion around a couple of key issues. So I'll first introduce Dr. Russ Altman. Uh, he's the uh, first speaker and, and former chair of the Department of Biology, Genetics, and Medicine at Stanford. Um, he's got a big focus in his own research and a passion for trying to figure out the complexity of drug interaction at all levels, at the sort of molecular level all the way up to the population health level. So we'll start with Russ. Thank you, and thanks for the invitation. It's a great privilege to be here. I'm going to spend more time on my title slide than I have ever spent before because uh, I have to help you parse it. First of all, today I'm going to be here a little bit as a computer scientist uh, because there's a lot of geneticists in the room. There's a lot of MDs in the room. Nobody knows what bioengineering is. So I think I'm going to talk about computer science. And then the title is a little bit of a pun. Those of you who are computer scientists or in, uh, in big data, uh, deep learning is a new kind of uh, machine learning paradigm that is kind of taking the world by storm. And learning healthcare system is, a, is an a, a idea that many of our, us are excited about, that one day all patients will be contributing to knowledge in an active, ongoing, real-time way. So I've tried to kind of merge those ideas to talk about a deep learning healthcare system. Uh, in, with respect to my definition of big data, um, there are these very good, thoughtful definitions. Uh, as opposed to the one I'm about to tell you, which is I think big data is data that is bigger than your organization can handle, and yet you think it's important. <laughs> and if you use that definition, then NIH definitely has a big data challenge. So uh, disclosures, uh, I'm going to use this. Uh, disclosures also provide perspective. So my Stanford uh, affiliation tells you that I care a lot about data analytics for precision health. I believe, and I also think that data science training needs to inc increase about an order of magnitude to uh, both take on this challenge as many, as well as many other challenges. My role as the PI of a pharmacogenetics knowledge base, it tells you that my, I have a passion about understanding the impact of genetic variation on drug response. I'm the co-PI of a FDA Center for Excellence, and I do think that this effort has the chance of um, creating a tsunami of IP, and therefore I would recommend that the NIH work with FDA to anticipate that tsunami. And then my professional consulting relationships make me very aware of the role, importance of accuracy and the importance of understanding how we're going to develop new drugs. So I want to step back for a minute. This is going to be at 80,000 feet. So I've been running a biomedical informatics training program for about 15 years. I've been affiliated with, for, affiliated with it for 25 years, and for 25 years, I have been telling the biomedical informatics students who ask me, why am I different from a computer scientist? I said, because you understand the domain of application, either biology or medicine, and can therefore pick features of the problem that are important to consider and stress while creating analytic methods. Uh, and I said that for 25 years with 100% confidence, as I say almost everything that I say. Uh, <laughs> But something happened in the last few years that is extremely disruptive to that idea. And that is that my computer science colleagues have <coughs> invented machine learning methods that seem to be able to infer very domain-specific features of interest with absolutely no knowledge of the domain, simply by using large amounts of data cr um, cleverly processed. So in particular, I'm going to take you through three or four slides. I'm going to take you through a computer science paper that, where the word biology medicine doesn't appear. But it's by Lay et al. in 2012 out of the lab of my colleague in Stanford Computer Science, Andrew Eng. And it was about the use of these things called neural networks to analyze all images on Google, uh, or a lot of images, millions and millions of images. And at the bottom in gray, uh, you see uh, these little gray balls which stand for the pixels in the image. And then what happens is those pixels get connected by mathematical functions to super pixels and super super pixels and super 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 pixels, pixels <laughs> that combine all the information in highly nonlinear ways. 
Anybody who knows a little bit of retinal physiology might recognize this. This is, in fact, it's called a neural net. And you can think about the bottom layer as the raw rods and cones. And you can think about the layers above as those integrating cells in the retina that start to do edge detection and whatnot. So they built a very comp complex architecture like this and exposed many, many images to this network. So here are not, there's uh, quite a few images, but this represents the totality of millions of images in, in Google. Those images are, are sent to this network. Each image populates the little gray balls, and then they percolate the information up uh, using things that I'm not going to discuss. But what happens, they do apply pressure, and this is another biological idea. They apply pressure to the um, nodes at the very top to be a relatively faithful representation of the information that's at the bottom. But yet, notice, there are many less balls at the top than there are at the bottom. So by applying this computational pressure, they force the balls at the top to kind of figure out useful compressions of the data that uh, allow it to be a faithful rendition of that lower le level, but with much less uh, actual data than you would have in the full set of pixelated images. So maybe you understood what I just said. <laughs> but the two key ideas is a compressed representation of the core images and no model of what's actually shown in pictures. Then what they did in this paper that really blew my socks off was they looked at those high-level nodes that were a compressed representation of these pictures, and they said, what kind of image would maximally stimulate one of these uh, Nodes. So I'm pointing at the first little orange node there, and they back-engineered an image that would light that node up as much as possible. And it was a human face, a highly nonlinear, uh, there's no lines there, in fact, it's all curvy. And that one node, when it sees a face in an image, lights up brightly, and that, in fact, that image would light it up the most brightly. We never told it about faces, we never told it about anything. So. The idea that I have been telling my students that uh, knowledge of life on Earth and what pictures are and what we take pictures of and why we take pictures was all irrelevant. Uh, the node on the far left can tell when there's a human face. Well, they looked at this another node in this network. Let's say that one, number two. It was a human body, kind of from the waist up. These get a little bit funky to look at, but I think you can see that there's a human body there, head. Uh, arms kind of ends at the waist. Again, that node lights up when it sees a human body in an image. Let's look at one more. Just I think you get the idea, but you gotta love this. Can anybody see what that is? It is a cat face. <laughs> it is fuzzy and nonetheless amazing that a very strong signal in the internet among images are cat faces. So just to help you a little bit, there's kind of an ear here, there's an ear here, there's a cute little mouth and eyes over here. You kind of step back and squint your eyes, uh, and this uh, blew everybody away. I can tell you that subsequently these neural network architectures, when there's enough data, have been outperforming most other machine learning. They may not do that forever, but right now, uh, they're the cat's meow, so to speak, <laughs> because of what they can do. Okay, so now let's talk about today's topic. <laughs> this is a, a, a picture from one of uh, Mike Snyder's papers. It just simply represents the totality of information that we're going to have about the members of this cohort. Lots of details to figure it out. I, it's a little bit focused on biological stuff. There's a lot of ohms listed in color. I'm embarrassed after the last session that the environment is this little tiny box, but <laughs> it, th this is not to scale. This is like the New Yorker cartoon from Mike Snyder. But the point is, with all the data we have there, think about those million patients and think about feeding those. This is a technical challenge, but, we can, but we're excited to work on it. Feeding those into the network, looking at those compressed net, uh, nodes that have been forced to kind of summarize some of the most important challenges, and then we see diabetes. I'm simplifying, but this is a vision that I would like us to be aware of. We look at another node and we see schizophrenia. And then we look at another node and something that perhaps has more environmental input, uh, malaria. I wanted to make sure I had an environmental. Uh, and you can imagine your favorite. And I think 
the, from that stems a lot of the comments I'm going to make in my last couple of minutes about how we should be thinking about this, this project. So in, in order to enable this transformative discovery, and a lot of these themes have already popped up, the data must be available to scientists very broadly with reasonable but not paralytic safeguards. And this includes computer scientists who don't know what IRB stands for uh, because they will be able to participate and perhaps make transformative discoveries. I think that the cohort must have a minimal core standard data set. If none of those nodes are always li lit, lit up by the underlying pixels, then we can't compare, contrast, and we certainly can't apply the pressure for it to try to learn the generalization rules of, of how to I, recognize disease and disease trajectories. By the way, we're starting to look at movies, and that'll be the uh, longitudinal part of this whole effort. So I'm not under any um, illusion that this will be only static data. I think we have to look at all these data types which have already been mentioned in our discussions. You might want to consider, we might want to consider that the cohort might want to reflect a U.S. disease burden as it will exist. Let's skate to where the puck will be, not where the puck is now. That's from Wayne Gretzky. Uh, and then finally, uh, I, I think that participants must feel engaged in the project. They must receive information back, and I think they have to be proud of their role in this study if it's going to really have any legs as a longitudinal huge project. Um, they might even get buttons and wear them proudly, uh, and they might even be known for their roles um, in, in, in the project. We'll be we're going to be, I'm sure, talking about technical stuff about big data. There's a lot to be said, but we have to think about distributed systems for sharing these genomes. Uh, probably distributed systems as opposed to single central sites, but that needs to be considered. Commercial providers have done some amazing things that need to be considered. It's critical to define the key metadata elements, that is data about the data, so that as the technologies evolve, we can remember what a genome looked like in 2012 and what it looks like in 2015. They're different. It's critical to link in standard ways to the electronic medical record, including imaging, omics, Wearables, I, sh I wanted to put on all four of the watches that I'm carrying with me because Ewan is right, I do indeed have four watches. <laughs> Standard ways, um, adopt an API and remember that everyone born after 1980 will expect this entire cohort to be managed on a mobile, on a mobile device. Finally, uh, I was very involved in the National Children's Study. I recommend to the committee that you read that report and consider it carefully. Lots of good lessons. The two ones I would highlight as my last comment is we should not create advisory structures that paralyze the initiative with too many mandates or expectations. It would be reasonable to do a few things very well. As I say to my students, answer one question before you answer 100 questions. And so I think that's an important thing. Secondly, I think the NIH has to form uh, challenging leadership models that are partnerships that are robust, self-healing, and sufficiently distributed to protect the mission of the project. There's a lot more in our report. And I'll thank you and stop there. All right. So next up is Dr. Atul Butte. He is the director of the new UCSF Institute of Computational Health Sciences. And also, I uh, saw with the announcement from, from Jerry Brown, um, driving the initiative in California on precision medicine. So you can help us understand what California is going to do and what we should do nationally. So take it away, Atul. Perfect. All right. Well, thanks for having me here bunch of disclosures, not even worth going through them. So I'm here uh, for, I'm only here for, I think for three reasons. First, I've been uh, a researcher, I guess, for 18 years, and my entire career is just based on uh, using publicly available data. We use public data to come up with new drug targets, new uses for drugs or drug repositioning. We use to find environmental pollutants for chronic diseases, uh, new biomarkers. A lot of times we spin these out as companies, though some are on the list here. So I'm a big fan of public data, and so I'm taking the data aspects, some of which are the big data aspects as well. So that's one reason I'm here. Second reason I'm here is because I guess I'm running this California initiative as of last week. Long story short, you're going to ask me questions about it because I'm not going to spend time on it. It's, it's a couple pilots, a couple million dollars each. It's rounding error compared to what you guys are talking about, but it's a first start. If things go well, hopefully we can get more money going to the state of California. But I can answer more questions about that. And third, I'm running this new uh, UC Health initiative. This uh, spans all five University of California campuses to integrate all 14 million patients seen in any of the University of California hospitals. There are 14 million, that's 4% of US population seen at University of California. We'll be integrating all those electronic medical records over the next uh, first bites moving, let's say, in 90 days, and hopefully all of it uh, once all the EMRs are all in sync there. I'm not going to answer any question. I'll answer questions about those. I'm not going to talk about any of those. So I got 10 minutes. I got 10 pieces of advice here. So I'm just going to go one through 10 here. All right, first. 
goodness, I got to start with this slide about disparities here. So uh, I, uh, what I would start, my slides are already messed up here. We cannot, given the events of last night, not think about the disparities here, okay? I, I'm glad at least a couple speakers have talked about it. Are we going to include any in the million of uh, the million you talk about here, the 2.2 million that are incarcerated? Are we going to talk about the 20% of elderly that are age, over age 65, if their incomes are under 25K, only 20% of them even have a smartphone? Every time I think about me being part of this study, then I think about my parents who barely know how to install an app on an iPhone, right? They have iPhones, but they don't, they even have Fitbits, but they don't really play with those things, right? So are we going to include any of those, dis uh, those folks? We've got to just think about the disparities here. The slides are all out of sync. Are you going to start with a million or are you going to end with a million? Okay, I don't think anyone's really mentioned that so far. Boy, you better keep the sticky and useful, and that's going to get back to the next point I'm going to raise. Uh, are you a rarity? Only 16% of people ever click on an app twice, okay? Uh, I know we're all in this room. The rest of the world, they install an app. They never click on the app again because they got nothing out of it the first try, right? Which means you're going to have to give the data back to people, at least give some kind of utility to them. Well, if the data is returned to the participants, they're going to obviously change their behavior and exposure. So this is a moving target. This is not like, you know, this world today, we're if they're volunteers, they're going to want this data back. Are you going to be able to tell that they're changing their behaviors? I'm just putting my own BMI curve up there like I do in my talks, two and a quarter years with my Fitbit and scale, and I've lost my 50 pounds with my Fitbit, right? So could you have told that I was doing this? You probably could look at my weight curve every day. I carry a scale in my carry-on bag even now, because, but I've lost 50 pounds with my Fitbit. So are these participants. So it's a moving target. Do we have any methods at all, informatics-wise, to figure out this signal of this moving target here? We don't even have enough power to even think about doing anything right. So you're going to have to think about downstream validation studies up front, right? So someone at least mentioned a mouse and a mouse knockout. So if I find some genetic hit, am I, am I ready with mice? That's great. So how am I going to validate a cell phone measure, right? I can't put that in front of a mouse, right? So are we going to have leave one sub-cohort out cross-validation, right? If it's a cohort of cohorts, we leave one out validation kind of thing. Are we going to validate with UK 10K? I mean, what exactly are we going to think about validating here? Or is the question here, are you testing whether every individual gets something out of the approach? If that's the hypothesis here, then it's going to be a very different validation strategy here. If done right, reproducibility won't matter. I'm going to spend two minutes on this slide here because we're in this reproducibility crisis. It's already been mentioned a couple times. And this one paper really influenced my life. This paper was in Nature Methods, Questioning Standards in Science. This is heresy. I'm on the NIH campus. I'm going to say it anyway. Right? So this paper came out from the mouse psychiatrists. Okay? Think about those two words together. Right? <laughs> mouse psychiatrists. And they were all in uproars because the West Coast labs, the East Coast labs, they look at genetics for psychiatry and mice, anxiety, depression. None of them are getting the same answer. So what do they do? They say science should be reproducible. We should all standardize how we do these experiments. So this is the cage you put them in and the water maze and all that. And of course, they all get the same answer. So science is reproducible. Hurrah. And then this group comes in, Nature Methods, and says, well, what happens if you change the strain of the mouse? What happens if you put two mice per cage or give them something to play with? None of the answers hold up because they got the most reproducible findings that are the least generalizable, okay? I sincerely hope we don't all have one way to do the blood pressure here, right? If you have 100 smart people and 100 different ways to do it, maybe there's a little bit more fault tolerance in this system here, right? Just overfitting the one way we're going to all agree to do this. So think about standards here because don't go too crazy with standards. Exploit the network effect. I think connecting cohorts and data to others to gain synergy is going to be important. We're going to need methods to connect these data sets, uh, keeping confidentiality. Lusola Mono Machado does some of this work, so do many others. But also connecting to other cohorts like pharma trials. Maybe, for example, just to give you specific advice, at the end of a pharmaceutical trial with 10,000 people, get them at that point. They got all this phenotyping already done. Someone else already paid the bill for that. Talk to the CROs, the contract research organizations, they would, might be open to actually participating. I know some of them actually are looking at this. Maybe that's a way to at least boot, uh, bootstrap your million. Maybe start with the 35 million that were discharged last year, right? There's a million in there somewhere. You already got all the lab tests. You already got a little bit of phenotyping. You're at least hitting the ground running. Maybe work with the Quest and LabCorp groups and others that have existing lab data on patients and start with those groups and go from there. So exploit this network effect. I'm not even going to mention 23andMe because there's going to be a story, obviously, tomorrow about that. I sincerely think the success of this effort depends on third-party usage. It's got to be easy to understand, like Russ was talking about, understand the data without you. It should be easy to build it, useful tools, mash this data up. You should not have to hire an insider or an expert to understand this data. 
of course it's a given, the cloud and all modern commercial tools and services should be allowed. It's kind of embarrassing we had to put out statements that they're now allowed, right? I mean, the rest of the entire business world already gets a lot of this. And I would put real money into dissemination. Do not assume this will happen correctly. This is beyond data sharing agreements. It's the biggest difference between genome and ENCODE, and to be blunt here. Why is one of those two much more easier to use than the other right now? Just think about that. Try to use ENCODE data. I love my friends on ENCODE, but I gotta call it like I see it. <laughs> but on the other hand, perfection is the enemy <coughs> of the good. Perfection in annotations and standards delays the data release. Sometimes you'd rather have it be 90% of the way, way there, but it's actually there now instead of waiting for the ontology to be created. You won't always make the right choices, except that now. I'm just going to quote the a Apple mantra here, keep simple things simple, but complex things possible, right? Yes, provide an API and a website, but also let people download the raw data, let others in and access and build alternative representations and enjoy that. Don't fight those, those people. Data gets stale rather quickly. The best resource for databases today until we get an NIH Data Discovery Index is the Nucleic Acids Research January issue every year. They have the master list of all open databases in all of life science and biomedical research. 1,500 data sets there today, 1,500. All of GenBank is one, right? And I think all the rest of NCBI is another paper. Even reference data sets get stale here. I want to show uh, one great example. Here's the ENCODE project, right? I mean. Uh, ENCODE projects is one line out of 1,500 in this database here. It's not even showing the graphic here because it's too big of a figure here. That's the same amount of money you're talking about here that went into ENCODE when it is what you're talking about here, and it's just now one other line in 1,500. So there's a little bit of humility we have to have here. Well, you could say, well, the president mentioned it. Well, that makes it uh, permanent. Well, this is funny. I mean, I <laughs> pulled this one up. This is one Al Gore mentioned in 1998. This is a cancer genome anatomy project, right? This predates TCGA. You know, it's going to enable scientists and researchers around the world to access to a website to bring us closer to a cure. CGAP isn't even in the 1,500 databases at the NAR database. How quickly things get stale, right? Because science is on to the next thing. So don't overthink the reference aspects here that people are going to use this forever, like the Genome Project. There's going to be limited accessibility at some point, and people will just move on. Here's the CGAP website. still runs, believe it or not. The shelf life from the technologies, you're going to pick one measurement technology for uh, methylation and then another year later everyone's going to say, oh man, they picked a stale one, it's last year's model, that data's no good because they're going to be on to the next one. And just every time you think about this, just think about the frame M heart study, it's got, I don't know, 15,000 people, it's on dbGaP, why aren't more people using something like that now? You should study that to figure out what's wrong with current databases, why aren't people using it like they should be? I know there's 350 data requisitions, but it could be more. And last, I'm going to say, leave something interesting for others here. Please do not shoot for an entire issue of science and nature that tries to answer everything about a million people here, okay? Like ENCODE. Leave some of the nature papers for others here, right? <laughs> the real value of the data set is going to be in others seeing questions that could be asked and answered that you didn't think of here, right? And I'll also say the great success stories already around the country with Geisinger, a million veterans, many more. I really hope this doesn't just go, this money doesn't just go to latecomers trying to copy what the forerunners have done, that we create something that cannot be done by the academic, medical, or private world. And that's it. All righty, and last but not least is Dr. Andrei Retsky from the University of Chicago. He's a professor of medicine and human genetics there. Um, also a senior fellow in both their computational institute as well as the Institute for Genomics and Systems Biology. Um, tell us what you got, and then we'll sit down and have a chat about all these things. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. It's late in the afternoon. I'm sure you're exhausted, and I have heavy Russian accent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll try to rush it through, but uh, yeah. Please give me some vital signs. <laughs> uh, so I start, well, first of all, I don't have disclaimers. Uh, I didn't know that we are required to give them. And I have multiple hats, but I also don't uh, show them here. I, I would like to talk about science and questions we can ask with this kind of data and maybe bridge the gap between different fields. And I start with metaphor. And I apologize, many of us flew here. And some of us will be flying today or tomorrow. But this metaphor is about uh, air disaster. And uh, air disaster is a metaphor of complex disease. It's a real accident. 
uh, January 8, 2003, phenotype. Uh, plane took off, stalled, crashed into the hangar 37 seconds later. And then there was careful investigation about what happened, right? Uh, it turned out there were two causes. Number one was so-called genetic, right? Uh, and specifically, you have turn knuckles. Uh, those cables were too tight, so tail wouldn't move full uh, range, right? So it's so-called genetic cause or structural. And there was uh, another cause which I would call environmental. The plane was actually overloaded. And why it was overloaded? Because uh, they computed load of the plane by multiplying number of people by average weight, which was computed 20 years earlier. And uh, b during this 20 years, average weight increased by 20 pounds or nine kilograms. So plane was both overweight and it couldn't uh, level itself because it was crippled, well, genetically. So uh, uh, my point is in this particular scenario, both environment and genetics uh, plays a role. And uh, ideally, I would love to have data that covers both simultaneously for the same people. Okay, that's my. Uh. So the data that we used in the past, which were uh, large, about 115 million people, it's about a third of the United States, which means that probably one third in this audience are represented there. And of course, they don't have genetics, and to get some genetics uh, and nine year coverage only, we have to play tricks. And the trick we used essentially to use. Mendelian disorders as genetic markers. When you have huge collection of people, you can use uh, Mendelian diseases as markers, essentially in the same way you would use other genetic markers. And if you rearrange, well, on the X uh, axis uh, are, on the Y are complex disorders and X are Mendelian disorders. So if you rearrange rows and columns, you will see that every complex disease has unique set of Mendelian companions. And you can also test uh, genetic models with multiple genes and so on. So uh, uh, we call it Mendelian code of complex disease. Uh, another kind of schizophrenic side of the same story, you can think about genetics of autism and uh, my colleagues, closest colleagues, uh, well, chased autism genetically for a long time. Uh, but if you look at the map of United States, you will see that there is a hundredfold difference in autism prevalence, right? And it tells us something. So, uh, as you know, uh, every day new things are introduced in the environment, and this is a real picture uh, about DDT just a few decades ago. So, uh, uh, one possibility is to use, uh, well, environmental indicators such as uh, birth malformations, which actually come, it's closer to Miranda's talk, uh, they come down to multiple environmental exposures. And my actually take home message is that 1% uh, increase in birth malformations predict 283% increase in autism. So it's a very strong effect. In the perfect world, what I'm trying to say, I would have uh, genetics and environmental data for the same people. And I'm really, really starting to salivate just thinking that this data might be existing in some future. So the current problem is that uh, people have to hunt uh, publicly accessible or publicly inaccessible data sets. And that's what we do. I'm literally going to data safari uh, once a month or something. So, uh, and apologies, clinical records are back of the elephant, but it's biggest <laughs> chunk. <laughs> also, we have environment, and I promised to Atul that I will have only one quote, and we also have unknown unknowns. <laughs> okay, so my point is that most exciting thing, in addition to kind of healing people, is to do exciting science. Uh, new science that would also help to understand better etiology of disease and eventually cure people. And uh, ideally, to understand really what's going on, we'll have to have a genetics uh, environment, which can be partitioned into multiple layers, including drugs, for example, and confounding factors, because to understand real picture, you have to take into account social, 
political, socioeconomic pressures, and so on. Otherwise, you will see, well, biased picture. Well, uh, I would also advocate looking at multiple diseases simultaneously. Disease is invented construct to some extent, and every complex disease is a mixture of multiple different disorders. Maybe it's overstatement, but I apologize. So it really benefits to look at, uh, well, swarm of phenotypes over some time. And uh, I also created my wish list, which is currently largely covered. Obviously, I would like deep clinical history on each person, which would be probably inexpensive if it exists already. Individual geographic trajectory, not one point uh, in time and space, but uh, essentially trajectory. Family history, if possible, also could be inexpensive. A genome and epigenome, it's, uh, ex uh, it is expensive, I understand this, but it would be great with annotations. Food, lifestyle, probably how much they work and exercise, that would be fantastic to have, but we don't have to have it for everybody. We can do imputation or something else, but it would be nice to have something to do estimates. Microenvironment, household purchases, like uh, chemistry, social network, microbiota. Omics data would be great. Outcomes, that's something that we also don't see right now, including mortality. So it should be over some time, and we should be able to see what happened to people who are still in the window of this study. And finally, ethnic mixture. I know that's a charged subject, but uh, often there are multiple, well, if you have a very broad representation, uh, you have good representation of population, but you have lower power, say, for genetic studies. So it has to be balanced, all that I want to say. And is it my last slide or it's stuck? Yeah. Okay. And a uh, little bit, I do have a little bit. Uh -huh. So uh, other data that is kind of inexpensive but exists is scientific literature, which can be also thrown to supply a molecular network, say, and uh, uh, background knowledge on medicine. Clinical notes, which can be mined deeply for comorbidities and deep history of individual person. And I would like also to mention DARPA Big Mechanism Project, which is related to precision medicine in the following way. Imagine that we have a very large collection of statements about molecular pathways. Uh, we can create hairball, it's a technical term as well, in the middle, right? A uh, huge collection of possibly millions of statements which are messy. But we have a lot of data so that we can use experimental data to disambiguate and make uh, this hairball tissue specific, disease specific, right? And then uh, using drug information, we can formulate hypothesis for individual treatment for individual patient. Essentially, it's a metaphor of well, leveling the plane automatically, right? You're trying to maintain person at the same level in the all vital signs, well, in a stable condition. I I'm not sure if it makes sense, but that's the uh, goal of the proposal. Pa punchline, large data sets matter, and no, not all of them are free, but it, it's okay. Uh, and of course, one million can be designed in multiple ways, some of which are better than others. And there are ways which would satisfy anyone, right? And it would be really nice to come up with strategy, objective function to minimize damage. Okay, and right now I think that we are pulling it in the different directions. And I'll finish here, thank you. Well, thank you. It was, there were some both commonalities and some differences in those that actually can let us go in a lot of different directions. Um, I want to ask one question because it, as I sat watching the three of you talk, um, it occurred to me that I personally and a lot of the people that I've met have been thinking about the cohort as in the cohort of people that we want to recruit for the million. But as I look at this sort of where the puck is going, to use the metaphor again, of what you're talking about in computational science, some of the things that you guys are talking about, 
how do we also make sure that we have a cohort of researchers that, that what's the workforce that we create to make sure that we can actually use this investment well and wisely as we go forward? Any thoughts about that? Yeah, I'll just say that we, it, that's, I think that's intricately connected with how hard it is to get the data because um, there are specialists who will do anything to get the data, but there are other people who have unbelievable novel technologies who may think every day about Netflix or Amazon or Facebook, and yet I think we want those people with minimal, I'm not saying zero, but with minimal uptime to be able to make contributions. So I think that um, in many ways academia is trailing industry because industry is creating these folks often getting training on the job because of the big data sets out, out in the world. Uh, and that's why I said that I think we really need to increase the analytics capabilities in biomedicine to kind of match this project and many, many other projects that are going to be, um, I think, limited by that person power. But the, the quicker fix would be to engage our colleagues from other departments who have been creating these power tools and who are really looking for, they have a hammer and they're looking for a really good nail to hit. Dangerous thing to, I understand the danger in that metaphor. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll just want to add to that. I think as amazing as this data set sounds like, even though not a bite of it has been collected yet, <laughs> we are going to be struggling to get eyeballs on this data set because there will be many, and there are already many, uh, in the next five years. So um, in some ways, we want to attract them. So you know, many groups have come up with competitions and challenges, and there's ways to get an audience or buy an audience. Um, kind of scares us academics when, the, you know, competitions, you only give the money to the winner, right? You don't give to all the players like uh, typical NIH grants work. But, uh, but those are mechanisms I've seen to get more eyeballs on data sets. At the same time, though, the domain knowledge needed is going to be hard. I mean, uh, they can understand movies because they order movies, right? Uh, uh, they don't know what a creatinine is. For, forget about a base pair, right? They're simple lab tests that they're going to struggle over. So you can't spend forever documenting everything either. So, I, Ben, we can start lining up. I'm, I'm, I want to hear most of the questions from you guys. You're, this audience is far wiser than I am. I can just help, uh, you know, do the Vanna White thing and connect you with the, with the, white, with the wisdom here. So um, I, I, I will, I'll ask another question while we wait for people to line up. But I, I also wanted to ask about, um, you hinted at it, Russ. Um, you said presumably we're going to develop a distributed infrastructure on this. So what do you guys think about the quote unquote platform? Is it some central database in the sky that needs to be under uh, control or is, is this some sort of federated model that, that we've really got to build out to do this? I like to be open-minded. So I would, and it's very premature to make any proclamation, but I would be stunned if it's not a distributed architecture for both political, social, and economic reasons. I'm gonna say the opposite of that. <laughs> okay. okay, so I'd be stunned. I'm stunned. <laughs> I'd be stunned if we actually uh, make it at the funding level of the weakest link, okay? Because today's experience with databases is the minute that last dollar goes in, people make noise and they want to pull the plug on this and they don't keep people hired. So I don't know if we would tolerate, you know, a tenth of the data being with, on one of the participants that maybe doesn't get renewed in the NIH cycle. So I, I, I think it might be more centralized. But if it's on the cloud, you just change who's paying the bills, not whether the data is there. Whereas if it's at, I agree, if it's at a server at Stanford and then Stanford gets defunded, that's very stressful. So I think that's what I meant by a distributed and also self-healing and robust. But you're absolutely right. These, these scenarios need to be anticipated and guarded against specifically. Yeah. Uh, I don't uh, that much care about what is implementation, but obviously it's a huge problem to make it uh, uh, secure for the patients, but at the same time have freedom for researchers to do, well, new things, because I'm af afraid that it will be implemented as a straight jacket, or it will be kind of easily hackable, and uh, you can't have both security and freedom, well, obviously perfectly simultaneously. Can I follow up uh, just briefly with that? Because you've used the large CMS uh, database uh, to mine, and could you describe your experience with that and what you thought the strengths and challenges were? Well, in this particular case, it's a little bit like uh, security clearance. If they trust you, you can do the data analysis. But uh, yeah, if you make it, it's impossible to anonymize uh, patient data completely. And if you achieve it at some point, data will become useless, I think, at least for research purposes. 
Zach Kohani uh, led on an article that I was part of a few years ago talking about information altruists. And we made a case in this article, which I can get the committee if it's of interest, that um, there are people who are less worried about their public, the pub publicness of their data. Uh, you worry about bias there because maybe they have a SNP that makes them information, information exhibitionists. But, um, but I think that we, with 350 million Americans and we need to figure out eventually how to get to a million, it might be that you have consents that are a little bit radical, um, perhaps in the sense of the PGP project that uh, George Church is running, in order to uh, enable lots of things. Um, I don't say that lightly because I understand that it's easy to say and hard to do, but I, I do think those people exist who would be willing, especially if we gave them some feedback about their data and if we gave them uh, some pride in participation. Uh, so I think that that model might m want to be considered. Yeah, I mean, so just to add on that, I mean, to take that to an extreme, there are the patients with the rare disorders that want more research on their disorders. And they, again, not to generalize, but they often are almost first in line to get more scientists to look at their data. So there, there are going to be those. But it also, it's also worth investigating how, you know, a company like Apple can get whatever, 20,000 people uh, in a study in a week. So there are people who want to share. Cool. Let's go over to this mic. Hi. Jenny Larkin, uh, Office of the Associate Director of Data Science. Fabulous talk. Um, so, Russ, your explanation of deep learning was, as always, wonderful. Um, the question I had for you, and I think, Atul, it relates to your point about the robustness and not being too controlling on the data, is the example you gave was images on Google. The data is identical. The content is different. Can you say something about what are the challenges NIH might face in, in applying that sort of really groundbreaking, innovative approach to the huge complexity of different types and formats of data? Yeah, so I'm acutely aware that that's where the, the straight um, analogy totally breaks down. And I used that really complicated picture on purpose because it showed it was not a grid of pixels. And so that's, but that is where the machine learn, the, the machine learning world has figured out that that's the problem with these approaches, and they are working feverishly to develop methods for hierarchical data, for just for fun funky uh, interconnected data. So I can't give a specific answer and say it's solved, but I know that we've used these technologies in much more non-uniform, on vectors of numbers, uh, vectors of features, some of which are real numbers, some of which are integers, some of with which are yes, no questions, which is getting a little bit more away from the pixel view of the world, and these methods are still working. So it's a very active area of research, and I'm, opti I'm an optimist, but I'm optimistic that this will uh, actually drive that community in a very focused way towards answering the questions we care about the most. Very Pollyanna-ish thing to say, but I believe it. Uh, uh, just really quickly, I mean, I think uh, really what you're getting at is they're all pictures, but they're all GIF or ping or whatever. There's there are certain file formats we might want to agree to in a loose kind of way, but the strictness of what goes in those files you leave open. There's a middle ground there, not going crazy over what's exactly in a file. Right. Mike? So Mike Gaziano, Million Veteran Program. Um, Russ, uh, um, just the, the, uh, the, 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 the deep learning um, cross-validation that might occur between cohorts. Um, how how much uh, is the, the the output dependent on the, the deep learning strategy? Is it, do 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 two cohorts that are comparing results have to have the same deep learning strategy to be able to compare? So this is a, of course a very deep question. I think I'm, so I'll answer it superficially. Uh, <laughs> there are emerging best practices for machine learning that are really very axiomatic, and so uh, you would certainly for example, not look for the cat picture that lights up the best from the set that you train, but go find another cat picture. So these principles that you're well aware of, of separating testing and training, all of these things have to be done very carefully, considering confounding bias. Um, again, I'm optimistic that that community, uh, in many ways because they are working in the industry for people who are paying them money and who lose a lot of money if they have uh, artifactual results. You know, if Yahoo keeps, I mean Yahoo, if Amazon keeps uh, recommending stupid things for you to buy or Netflix keeps telling you you stupid movies, you're going to stop using them. So they have real financial incentives to solve these problems. Uh, and so I think w piggybacking on some of that uh, is helpful. I think we're going to have our own challenges as well. But I think the short answer to you is I am confident that we can do 
careful validations to make sure that we don't trick ourselves with these, um, with these architectures. There is an issue of overfitting, which is a technical term, and people think about that as well a lot. Francis, go for it. So I'm interested that this group, distinguished as they are, didn't really say a lot about what many people are deeply concerned about in this vision, which is uh, the very clumsy nature of electronic health records. And if we're planning to utilize that as a major input uh, to this happy vision of where we want to get, um, what's the chances that that's actually going to be feasible? We have certainly had other groups that have been looking at that rather intensively over the course of the last couple of months. Uh, and I'm just curious what your view is uh, about how big a problem do we have here? Meaningful use seems to be an aspiration that uh, we are a long way from getting to, at least in terms of research utility. My colleagues will have a lot to add, but I, I can tell you that in talking to Josh Denny, who I believe is the host of your next meeting, I think one of the key things that this committee should get out of the visit to Vanderbilt, which is a leader in this, is the exact reality of electronic medical record data. It is, it is created to deliver care and to bill and not to do research. Yet Josh and others like him have done amazing things to extract value from it, but I think a sophisticated understanding of the problems and challenges with electronic medical records electronic medical records is absolutely critical to understand so that it, you don't think of it as this amazingly almost free source of high quality phenotypes, which it is not. But Josh is a world's expert on that, so you have the right people on the committee. Yeah, I'll say the same thing. Because Josh is on the committee, I didn't feel like I had to take out of my 10 minutes. But I will say, I think it really depends on the level of question you ask, right? So if we're going to try to get to phenotypes for a GWAS, of course, we've got to go through into depth to figure out what exactly is a phenotype here or there. But there are probably still low-hanging fruit kind of questions that could still conceivably be solved by claims data, right? I mean, we can't ignore that. So um, it, from our perspective, from the University of California system, we're going to try to go for some quick wins. There are going to be some quick wins, but then... As we get more of the bytes moving, more of the data, of course, we're going to get to more sophisticated solutions. But if we can't show something quick, even with the kind of superficial level of connection, I think um, yeah, it's, it's hard to get further buy-in. So it's the only way forward there. Uh, if I may add my two cents, uh, you can think about electronic medical records as uh, X-ray uh, photograph, right? It probably doesn't make sense uh, immediately, but with proper processing and right model, I think you can get 3D structure of what's going on. So yeah, essentially it is data, it's messy data, it's imperfect data, but it's useful data, I think. And I'll just add one comment. I mean, I hear people, it may be just sort of looseness in the language that they're using, but I hear people even, even come up a couple of times a day that's like, oh, as we put all of this data into the electronic health record, and I'm like, what electronic health record are you using that you think is ready for the variety and velocity and volume of data types that we've actually talked about today? So it's probably important just to sort of state that it's like the data infrastructure that you're going to create, the, the electronic health record is one of the data feeds to it, but it is not the repository and the resource that you're going to use to get the research done. Actually, one strong piece of advice I would give you is as a, as a universal input format, just accept paper, okay? Just accept paper. Be ready for volunteers to send you FedEx boxes of just paper from their records. You could work today, right? You could hire enough people to just type them in, but you could still start today if you really had to. All right, let's go over here. <laughs> Saul Schiffman, University of Pittsburgh. I, I want to uh, express a caution about a caution that a tool uh, put up, which is about the effects of self-monitoring, that are we going to change the health behavior mm -hmm. and the health of these people? Uh, by, by giving them feedback. And, and I guess I would make two points. One is, uh, first of all, if we have to do observation, you know, Heisenberg principle, that could have some effect. Um, uh, but, but again, we're seeing more and more people monitoring themselves anyway, so it's not a completely artificial state imposed by the study. But, but I guess I would offer the perspective I have as a sometime clinical researcher, which is that, um, when I'm reviewing a paper or thinking critically about my own work, I think, oh my God, we had them monitor their behavior. That could have changed everything. And then later in the bar, when I'm hanging out with other people who are doing clinical treatment, we're all saying, nothing we do changes their behavior. <laughs> and, and I think the latter is probably closer to the truth. There, there's a degree of concern. You know, frankly, if 
if giving people cell phones and having them do this change their behavior, let's scrap the project and give everybody cell phones. Totally agree. Totally have a agree. cohort of 350 million, give them a cell phone, we solve it. No, I totally agree. It's, it's not even caution. I mean, I think it's really more just let's make sure we at least understand that and perhaps from the data side, just make sure we're ready for no, that. I agree, so, agree with that. Yeah. Keep going over here. Hi, I'm Cindy Gagan, and I'm a cancer patient advocate, and I really appreciate this day and this panel specifically. One of the challenges, well, there's three challenges I'm going to point out, but one that I think is exquisite and, and big is one that Atul mentioned, and that's diversity and representation. I've been an advocate for 20 years, and most of these data sets, with the exception of electronic health records and potentially claims data, they are not representative of the population. And so I think that if there was one hurdle that we needed to overcome, that is absolutely it. And to that, I would add potential incentives, which might be some sort of stickiness. Had anybody thought of potentially asking the public or potential participants what questions might be asked? Because it might surprise you. It might not be as big and bold and audacious as you think. And the and the third thing is, um, no, I don't remember what I was going to say. But the, th but the third piece of this is really, like, what's in it for me? So can we, the public, use this data? Can you train us to be the new workforce? So if you really want to make something sustainable and representative, we really need to start thinking beyond what we know today and the data that already exists. Let me just ask the panel here, are you imagining and assuming, I'll just start an example here, that the members of this cohort can go and look at their own individual data and get and compare it to some, uh, you know, analysis of the others? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> and that was a yes to my own question as well, so. All right, I just want to make sure. I mean, it's just, just, just a thought here. Uh, let, me, let me go to the woman standing here, and then I'll take the, the folks who are pleasantly seated. <laughs> She's getting her more steps than the rest of us are, so it's good. <laughs> Rima Dauk from the Duke Medical Center. Just cautionary words in terms of making sense of large data. It's good to gather data, but to make sense of it and use it. We gave 10 centers, uh, you know, a, a protocol to collect blood samples. And we profiled, we got the, the blood back, we profiled these samples, assuming we, we gave them the exact same protocol. We could separate using metabolic signatures, five, six platforms, not one. We, ca we could separate easily the 10 centers based on where the samples came from. All right, that was lesson one. Lesson number two, you know, if we did not have exactly all of the right metadata, when the samples were collected and all types of meta metadata, uh, supplements these individuals were on. We could pick up medications. We could pick up all sorts of signals within these. The lesson, the lesson learned is that, of course, the metadata is key. And number two is, if we are thinking about a million now, not 10 centers, how are we going to standardize and get this blood? Uh, our, our personal decision was to get a blood unmanipulated, just get a blood, freeze it, don't do anything to it, just ship it. Ship it back to us. Right? Number two, technologies continue to evolve, so I think there's got to be part of the vision, perhaps just blood unmanipulated, and we can sort out as technologies get better, we can sort out what methods we want to use uh, to, to derive uh, the knowledge. No, I would agree, but at the same time, the perfectionism is going to kill this thing. I mean, if you really need all of that standard in a million people, uh, you're just never going to get there. I mean, to get all the level of supplements, most patients don't even tell their doctors today. It's in their own interest, and they don't tell the supplements right now. So research on an app to type all that in is going to be tough. I mean, you might never get started. That's the warning. But, but we can see clearly all of, the, all of the supplements, all of the medications, Absolutely. they do imprint metabolism. Absolutely. So we'll have to build right. methods right. that are going to have to and compensate the, for this. Yeah. That's the only way to do it. Uh, and if I may, uh, actually, it's a not unique problem when you have heterogeneity of samples. It's true for any geographic data, and there are methods actually how to deal with this kind of data. So it's not completely. Can I just add, I agree with you completely that we have to build those methods, and it's possible to build those methods, but we have to invest in building those you got to say who you are, by the way. I'm Mari Lynn Miranda from the University of Michigan. And she's consistent from the last panel, so that's good. <laughs> 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 Rob, let's go for it. Rob Kaler from FDA. Um, I'm, my head is spinning. I mean, these were these were great. 
but there's always a but, of course. When, when you say precision medicine in the public, that means medicine. That means making decisions and having therapies. Um, what worries me right now is that you know a lot of what I hear discussed is going to be really fun and interesting. You, you may find great relationships. You may find even causal <laughs> inference with great methods. But you know, I could give you 10 cases this year where we even had causal inference for something that was related to bad outcomes. But an obvious treatment actually was harmful, not beneficial. So um, is this just a fun exercise, or are you going to meet the public's expectation based on the term that you can really inform decisions that will improve health? So I'll take a shot at that. So uh, it's funny that you, uh, you asked that, because I was thinking in this morning session that you, you know, you, unprecision medicine is saying, I'm going to give you a pill. And precision could be, I'm going to give you 1.00 pills. But that's not really what any of us are talking about. I was thinking, that's what I was thinking to myself. I, I have this little inner monologue. Uh, but what we are, th think, I think Russ, what, there's a pill for that, yeah, but just so you yeah. know. <laughs> I think what these talks were saying is we are going to be able to make fine distinctions to define subsets of patients where the treatment will probably be a similar treatment. And, and right now, clini clinically, we struggle with diabetes, where it's probably 30 or 40 independently evolved uh, glucose state problems, uh, schizophrenia, autism. So I think that the first step that we actually, and I think you, it's a fair criticism, we, we mostly focused on understanding and dividing up the world. And I think what we left unstated, and you're kind of shining a light on, is given the distinctions that I think all of these technologies are going to be able to make, then the second phase or the second part of this has to be, okay, now that I've subdivided the world into a more hom hom homogeneous uh, set of uh, disorders, can I find the uh, treatments that matter. And, and my talk didn't talk about that, although, I, as you know, in my own work, I care deeply about that. Uh, so I had a slide, actually. I was going to start with that. I cut it out to save space. But I think before you get anywhere, you've got to figure out what's the question you're asking here. I mean, you, that's what you're really getting to here. I mean, you're going to spend a lot of money and c get a lot of people involved. And so from, like, most basic to most sophisticated question, I had a list in my kind of head. What are we going to learn out of this, right? Are you going to learn how to run a large cohort? Of course you're going to learn that. I hope you learn more than that. Maybe you're going to learn how to run a cohort of cohorts. Kind of hasn't been done like this. Maybe you'll learn that. Are we going to learn anything about health? Okay, disease is there, but are we going to learn about health? Are we going to learn how to diagnose diseases sooner? Okay, that takes it up a notch. Are we going to learn how to improve health out of this? Okay, that takes it up another notch. Are we going to learn about some new biology of diseases? I can easily see GWAS is being run on extreme phenotypes. And the hardest, though, is are we actually going to improve the health of the million? Right? That's what you're trying to get to at the end. You guys that do run studies where you're trying to improve county-wide health, I haven't seen that actually being proposed here yet. You could propose that, right? But I think that you, we're, we're talking about playing with the data here because that's a minimum here, right? If you want to go for improving the health, it's a moving, moving target there. I guess it was obvious to everybody else in the room, but what Saul showed, I think, may be the revolutionary key. And, of course, it's what all businesses are already doing every day that we you know, when we check the box with whatever search engine we use, we agree to it. But once you've divided up this world, you could randomize very quickly and get answers in a cohort like this uh, using the technology they already have in hand. That, 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 thank you for saying it that way. That's precisely what I meant by the deep learning healthcare system, that, the, that this has to end up in a healthcare system, I, I'm thinking of this million as a prototype. Presumably, we figure out what's going on, and we have a 350 million cohort that then gets the best of this one million, and then we can do deep learning to, for, for discovery of best treatments. One more quick follow-up to Dr. Hudson. We have to fix the common rule for this to work. But. On it. <laughs> I'm smiling because I can't wait for the world. The, uh, we're going to be in a world where a simple, let's say, two-week testing with this cohort will meet the criteria of something for the FDA someday. I can't wait for that world, actually. <laughs> so why are you talking about common rule here, huh? Let's. Uh, uh, um. I would like to chip in that uh, it really depends on uh, clearly defined objectives of the study, how it will be designed, right? If you want to improvement in health in X years. It should be one design. If you want to answer fundamental questions and improve health at bigger scale, but l well later, it's a different design. And I think it should be explicit, and it should come in the well study design. 
I'd like to follow on to that and ask your thoughts on that specific question, right? So if we have a combination of short-term goals and long-term goals, how would you design the cohorts to achieve each, both of those? Well, uh, it's essentially balancing <laughs> the pros and cons of different strategies. So uh, with a careful design, I think it's possible to minimize damage and make sure that X studies from different camps uh, have what they want. So uh, I can't be more specific until objectives are, well, clearly defined, but I think it's doable, right? I think that the answer to that question is probably the previous session on environmental, because you can change the environment and you can change, well, I don't know what I'm talking about, which makes it easier for me to say this. It, it is hard to develop drugs. It takes 10, 15, it takes a long time, new therapies. But uh, if, we, if this study comes up with you should not smoke and you should be screened for cancer, at col col I'm trying to think of one that actually still stands up to the evidence, <laughs> colonoscopy. <laughs> you should, and so if you could come up with these kind of environmental statements, that would give the American public quick wins in a much shorter time than we have a pill for your cancer, we have a pill for your seven subtypes of diabetes. So it may be that the answer is in, in those earlier sessions. Yet they would be bored with those answers, right? Because we already know that, right? I mean, I think we, I well, think. Well, no, no, not those, no, no, I'm sorry. Those, those were my examples of the new ones we're going to discuss. Right. Oh, no, no, no. You're not allowed to just rediscover So, so uh, exactly. I mean, I don't know the history, but if I just think, I mean, closest analogy is going to be Framingham in my mind. And so how far was it from the start of Framingham to this common word, use of the word cholesterol, right? Was that a decade, two decades? I don't know how long it took that. I mean, so if that's, that's a short-term win from Framingham, not the long-term win, right? Everything else is long-term win. So that's, uh, hopefully the short-term win is faster. It's like in one five-year cycle, maybe. I don't know. But no, I would go after six. Individuals, unfortunately, it did start. I mean, you're going to get something sooner and then maybe get to the healthy ones later. Yeah, and I think, I mean, per the last panel, with the examples of, you know, randomization of things like apps and interventions on, on a different scale, I mean, those, those obviously can just occur at a completely different time scale. So Esteban has been waiting back here and then Sakin after him. Great. Uh, Esteban Richard, uh, University of California, San Francisco. I wanted to touch upon two things. One was the, the cancer advocate had mentioned about inclusion and representation. And we're spending a lot of time about coming up with a grandiose, most comprehensive study. But someone had mentioned that if we come up with the most grandiose study, it's likely to fail because it's not generalizable. And uh, going picking up on what she had said, um, in '93, Congress required the inclusion of women and minorities in all cl NIH-funded clinical trials. And of 10,000 trials published up until last year from the NCI less than 150 would include non-European populations. So that's less than 2% of 10,000 clinical trials. And so the generalizability is not there. We've done great at making precision medicine precise for EGFR receptor or whatever, but it's not hitting the masses. And since 40% of the U.S. is non-European and large base of the tax base that funds all this, I think it's incumbent upon us to make sure instead of shooting for the moon, but we also make sure that that moon affects the entire world. Sorry. I, well, Bray Patrick Lake it is. Um, so just a reminder that on July 1st and 2nd, we're going to be having a workshop on participant engagement and health disparities. So I look forward to addressing these issues in depth at that time. Yeah, Sachin Kutterpal from the University of Michigan. I, I think there's an issue of expectations here, which is uh, we need to be really transparent with everybody involved about this. Number one entity we need to be transparent with is the patients. I think they don't really appreciate how imprecise their care is. So it's about making it just a little bit more precise. The, the fact that the majority of their care is off CMS performance measures as opposed to real trials. I mean, that's what's happening on a daily basis. And part of the consent process, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, forces us to broker an interaction where we say, we're about to deliver this care to you. We have no idea if it's going to work for you or not. Help us figure that out for yourself and the next set of people. And that's this whole kind of partners with us thing, you know, the participant piece. But it's very uncomfortable for us as a medical community to say that we actually don't know what we're doing. But if we say it, I think everybody will be much more agreeable to the concept that this thing is a success when we do it. <laughs> I, 
I know you didn't ask a question, but I have to. I, obviously, we agree. I mean, it's it's going to be about marketing. It's about getting them, you know, participants engaged here. But life is also busy for a lot of people too. I mean, so twenty five thousand people installed whatever the research kit stuff is from Apple, right? That thing buzzed in my phone for three days. I shut the damn thing off. I mean, how many people are still using that thing, right? A week later. So it's stickiness. It's about other things in life over the next five years that are going to distract people from participating in this, too. So it's just reality, too. So of course they should be engaged. So I, I, uh, Sakin just mentioned expectations management. And at, at Intel, we, when we do your uh, performance reviews at the end of the year, there's a formula called S equals R minus E. Success equals results minus expectations, right? So. <laughs> That's a, whole, that's a whole diatribe. I just won't do that today. But um, so I, use that in the study section. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, even again, if, as I'm just listening to the discourse around this room, even in the last 30 minutes or so, I've heard some people call it the study. Some people have called it the studies. And yet at the same time, as I listened to what the three of you said, it's more like you described NIH b building on a national platform for the future of studies. Which is it? I mean, what, what are your thoughts on, is it a study? Is it the studies or my, is it a platform? Well, my entire prep work was on the car ride here is looking at Francis's slides, which are publicly available. And so it talks about a court or courts. It talks about a platform, a short term, a long term. That's all we really have to go on right now. I mean, if we're talking about actually influencing, you're talking about influencing the participants. They're not even all patients or participants here, right? But if you're talking about influencing their care providers too, that's another level to this study. I didn't even you know, think that you would even touch or want to touch here. but. Uh, so I think there are kind of probably going to be boundaries here, but, but that's where I drew them. All right, let's wrap up with Mike, and then we'll hand it off back to, to Rick to take so, us home to the end. So just, you know, just the, I think the Framingham example is a, is a really interesting one. Uh, it did take quite a while before we got cholesterol, and it was about 15 years, and, and they didn't let not knowing what they were, were doing get in their, in their way. Um, and, and we and should be fine then. <laughs> <laughs> but they built, if you think about it, they built a platform. They didn't have, when they, in 1947, they didn't have regression modeling. They didn't have a computer. It was in the 60s when they finally came around and had the tools that they needed uh, and coined risk factor and risk modeling and things like that. Yeah. They didn't have a clue that that's what they were building. And they built a platform that not only, for, it was a study, but then it became a platform for heart disease and cancer and dementia and everything else. So, I mean, I looked everywhere on the internet for a price tag in the end for Framingham. I actually can't even find one on Google. I don't think anyone wants to compute that, but in some ways it was worth it. But it's probably way more than what we got to spend here, though. Yeah. Although I do think, I agree with everything that's been said. I do think it would be good to have one or two hypotheses to answer one or two questions, but then build a platform that you really believe in your heart can answer a lot more questions. It's one of the things I love about the PCORI net. They're doing the aspirin thing. I love the aspirin thing. It's a straightforward question. It ensures that this whole thing gets us at least one answer. All right, should we thank our panelists here at the end of the day? So first, I would like to, uh, again, thank uh, all of our speakers and moderators for uh, these sessions. Uh, we had very high expectations uh, for them coming in, and uh, I'm pleased to say I think uh, the quality of the discussion far exceeded uh, our lofty expectations. It was really uh, an exciting afternoon, uh, and uh, I think has helped uh, shape some of the promise and also many of the challenges. And uh, I don't think we can uh, leave today uh, anticipating that uh, we've, we've narrowed the scope of the problem or made it uh, a lot simpler, but we've defined some of the remarkable opportunities. And the things that I come away from today uh, thinking, reflecting upon are that uh, if we think about where we were when cohort studies were uh, really launched uh, 60 years ago or so, and think about what has changed in the technologies uh, that we have now. Uh, the genomic technologies, of course, have totally transformed from, uh, you know, we didn't even know the genetic code when uh, many of these studies uh, were first uh, constructed, and now we can sequence whole genomes uh, uh, quite expeditiously. Uh, secondly, our ability to uh, produce other uh, orthogonal data sets and uh, the types of metabolomics uh, that we heard about. If you think about the things that we measure routinely in every patient uh, when they come into a hospital with uh, uh, an acute illness today, it's very different. Uh, it's, it's very little different from what we've done for the last 40 years. There are very few new analytes that have been identified uh, that have been added to the routine medical armamentarium. 
Uh, and uh, it's hard to imagine that uh, with the incredible advances that have uh, been made in understanding the complexity of metabolism and the ability to measure these metabolites, that they, we will not be able to find new biomarkers that are highly predictive of the occurrence of common diseases through an approach of uh, this, through a study of this kind of cohort. And I think that's uh, extremely promising and to me uh, personally uh, exciting. On top of that, of course, the advances in the ability to actually use this data and compute upon it in meaningful ways that are going to help us uh, get answers. And th some of the discussion we had in this last session, uh, you know, we, I have personally joked many times about collecting large data sets and believing that at the end of the day, if you just collect enough data, it will begin to explain itself. And of course, we heard several examples that look frighteningly like uh, that exact uh, example uh, this afternoon. And I still do not believe that it will be that simple. But, none the, but nonetheless, there's no doubt that the ability to analyze large data sets and extract information in new ways profoundly changes the kinds of opportunities that we can anticipate coming from a cohort of this size. Some of the questions that I think came out of uh, this uh, afternoon's discussions very appropriately focus on what's the study design going to be? Should we be starting with healthy people of a defined uh, age range? Should that age range include sets of people starting with a birth cohort or the pediatric population? Should we simply study the heart of the distribution ascertaining everybody or should we try to bias the cohort toward people who are ill initially or more likely to be ill? Uh, initially. These are clearly important questions that will bias in different ways the ability to get information in the near term versus the long term, and these are critical questions that we have to think uh, uh, critically about. Uh, but I come away from uh, this afternoon's uh, discussions uh, with no doubt that there are extraordinary opportunities for advancing uh, the understanding of human health. And of course, I think we have to be uh, cautious and uh, uh, about what we promise in terms of therapeutics. And we, of course, are, are all uh, sobered by the fact that we understand the pathogenesis of many diseases, and yet the pathogenesis has not immediately led to uh, new approaches to, uh, to therapy. And uh, as a consequence, I think we have to recognize and uh, acknowledge that understanding does not necessarily lead immediately to uh, therapeutics, uh, but it surely is along the steps uh, to getting there. And lastly, I'll note uh, one further uh, advance that I think is really critical to try to put a cohort of this sort together and propagate it over time is the incredible advances in social media and the ability for patients to get quick feedback, uh, participants in the cohort, quick feedback to their own status, how they compare to others, and how to remain engaged uh, in the process. And we'll hear more uh, about this uh, tomor in tomorrow's discussions uh, as well. So I think it's been a sensational uh, afternoon, and I'd like to uh, ask for a round of applause again for the uh, participants and the moderators. Thank you so much. I have uh, two last uh, uh, announcements to make. First, uh, working group members who have not uh, uh, responded to whether they uh, will participate in a working dinner, social working dinner tonight, uh, please uh, let us know. Uh, and then uh, lastly, I want to uh, point out that the video booth will remain open until 6.15 this evening. And those of you who have not contributed your thoughts and ideas, uh, please uh, feel free to go across and do that. And they will open at 8 a.m. tomorrow. So we really value your contributions. Thanks again for a great day.